The nature of God is a complex topic that has been at the heart of Jewish and Christian theology for centuries. The doctrine known as the Trinity teaches that while God is one, He is a plurality within a unity. The triune God eternally existed in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. At the heart of this issue is the identity of the Messiah. Is Jesus divine, God come in the flesh, or is he simply a created being who was designated as the Son of God? Tonight, we debate this foundational doctrine. Four experts, two Trinitarians, who will argue that the triune nature of God, revealed in the Scripture as Father, Son, and Spirit, and the deity of the Messiah are foundational truths, essential to biblical faith, and two non-Trinitarians who will argue that the Trinity is not biblically sound, but rather has grown from historical church tradition rather than from biblical roots. In addition, they believe the Messiah, although the unique Son of God, is not himself a pre-existent divine being. Representing the latter position, let me introduce our two non-Trinitarians. First, we have Sir Anthony Buzzard. He's a graduate of Oxford University and Bethany Theological Seminary. He holds master's degrees in theology and modern language. He served 24 years on the staff of Atlanta Bible College and serves as co-editor of a journal from the Radical Reformation. Joining him is Joseph Good, the founder and director of Hatikva Ministries. He spent the last two decades learning and teaching Hebraic values and concepts especially in the context of the non-Jew. His recent projects include very detailed research on the temple from traditional Jewish historical and archaeological sources. Now, arguing for the Trinitarian position, Dr. Michael Brown is a published Old Testament and Semitic scholar holding a PhD in Near Eastern languages and literatures from New York University. He's well-known as a Messianic Jewish apologist and as the author of a five-volume series, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, also serving as, uh, as a professor at a number of leading seminaries. Joining him is Dr. James White, the director of Alpha and Omega Ministries. He's a professor of Greek systematic theology at Golden uh, Gate uh, Theological Seminary, as well as various topics in the apologetics. He's the author of many books, including The Forgotten Trinity. Gentlemen, welcome to Jewish Voice. Let's give them a warm welcome. Now, let me explain how this uh, debate will work tonight. There's going to be three main sections of which I will serve as moderator and host. Part one uh, will begin with opening remarks from each team member. These remarks will be limited to two minutes each, uh, followed by 10 questions submitted in advance by our experts, five from each side. Uh, these are going to be in debate format. So I'll address a question to one team at a time, altering sides. Uh, the team addressed will have two minutes to give a response to the question. Now, when 30 seconds remain, you're going to hear a single bell. Everybody hear that? That's what it'll sound like. It's not signaling us to go to dinner, but uh, telling us that we have 30 seconds remaining. So this is gonna signal that you need to wind down your response. Now at two minutes, you're gonna hear two dings of the bell. Bill? Okay, at which time you need to conclude or I will stop you. Okay, the opposing team will then have 90 seconds to give their rebuttal uh, the original side, 90 seconds to respond, and the opposing team, a final 90 uh, seconds uh, to give their final rebuttal. So the two exchanges back and forth uh, for each question. Uh, now, in uh, each case, you're going to hear one dig when 30 seconds remain, and two when the time allotted is up. As moderator, I will hold the option of a follow-up question. Uh, if I use it, each side will be given uh, 90 seconds uh, to respond. We'll also then take a short break, followed by part two. Now, in this section, uh, we're going to have a 30-minute uh, time limit. It'll be a free-form discussion uh, of the two positions. I'll ask a series of questions. 
alternating between both sides. In this form, it will take approximately four minutes for a lively discussion of the question from all sides and then move on to the next question. Uh, part three of the debate will feature a 30-minute period of questions from our studio audience, which may be directed to either side or to a specific panelist. The individual or team addressed will be allowed two minutes to answer and may be followed by comments from the opposing side of up to 90 seconds. Uh, we'll conclude the debate with closing statements from each of our experts, again, limited to two minutes, at which time I will conclude with prayer. So gentlemen, if you're ready, uh, we're going to begin with your opening uh, statements. We flipped a, a coin earlier, and the non-Trinitarian team won, so they have elected to go first. So I'm going to turn it over to you gentlemen. And uh, Dr. Buzzard, I believe you're going to begin. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for coming to this extraordinary occasion. Uh, my point of view is simple, uh, based on 40 years of looking at the Bible and saying, what did Jesus believe about God? And I think it's quite simple. He recited the Shema of Israel, which says that God is one Lord, a single Lord. Had we not abandoned Jesus, I think we'd be doing fine. But Christianity is the only world religion that's abandoned Jesus at its creedal statement. I think that's a serious matter. So my point would be, study the Shema, read what Jesus said to the Jew when he asked about the Shema. He agreed with a Jewish expert, biblical expert, that the Lord our God is one Lord, Kyrios Is, one single Lord. That should be the end of it. And then double that up with all of the thousands and thousands of singular pronouns, 62,000 singular pronouns in the Bible, I am God, nobody is beside me, it's me, no one else, before me, no one, that's really very simple. So I don't think it's complex, but it's become complex over the years. Okay, thank you. Joseph Good, two minutes. Uh, having expressed my faith in a Messianic Jewish context for about 32 years, a little bit plus, I've come to learn many truths about Hashem. One of the most important principles I've learned is that Hashem deeply loves His people. He longs for a relationship with them. One of the highest callings that an individual is to have is to know and to understand Hashem. In a near countless number of passages, Hashem has expressed that He is the one and only true God. This fact was ingrained into virtually every facet of the Jewish people's interaction with one another and with Hashem directly. For thousands of years, the Jewish people have been the ardent defenders of this truth. They have believed in Hashem. They long for the coming agent of Hashem's redemption, the Messiah. Messiah. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Hashem's deliverer was revealed in the man Yeshua. Yeshua declared faith in and proclaimed the one true God. Yeshua lived a sinless life dis despite being tempted in all things like the rest of humanity. Yeshua was crucified. He was then raised from the dead by Hashem. His sacrifice has provided us our redemption to Hashem. The scriptures are clear. Hashem is not a deceiver. And he has been consistent throughout scriptures in declaring that he alone is God. No scripture clearly defines the Trinity. Nothing declares in a straightforward manner that one must believe in the triune nature of God. Nor is there a passage that insists that one must define Yeshua as the triune God, the Son. When seeking a solution to the controversy or problem, most often the simple solution is the truth. It does not require complicated theological exercises nor suspension of logic to believe that there is but one God, the Father, and that Yeshua is His Mashiach or His Messiah. I plead before you now that you listen to our discussion tonight with a heart that's willing to hear. Thank you, Joseph. Good. And now we're going to hear from the uh, Trinitarian side, and we're going to begin with you, Dr. Michael Brown. Well, the, uh, the interesting thing tonight is that I'm the only Jew on the panel here, and with all my heart and soul, I hold to the Shema. I hold to the oneness of God, that there is only one God, and I would die for that principle. I'm captive by the scripture. Perhaps of anyone at this table, I'm the least moved by church history and church tradition, but I'm captive to the scriptures. So when, when Thomas refers to Jesus as my Lord and my God, when he is explicitly called God in Psalm 45, and that is quoted in Hebrews, the first chapter, when the overwhelming witness of the New Testament is that the Son is eternally pre-existent, 
I have to bow down to the truth of the word and recognize that the one God that I worship is complex in his unity. He is hidden and yet is revealed. He sits enthroned in heaven and yet fills the universe and can visit us on this earth even in bodily form. The scriptures are explicit that John says that Isaiah saw Jesus, saw the Son. The scriptures are explicit in multiple testimony, verse after verse, that it was through the Son that the universe was made. And it is Jesus who says of himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. A created being cannot say this. Let me tell you why the stakes are so incredibly high. My friends here hold that you are to bow down before a glorified man and confess him as Lord. That the same praise, honor, and glory that goes to God in the book of Revelation goes to the Lamb, to a created being. To me, the notion that it is a created being that we should bow down, call Lord, worship, and pray to, as based on the New Testament, is a, is a heretical and dangerous notion that we need to distance ourselves from and recover who Jesus truly is, according to the scriptures. Based on that, when we look at the person and work of the Spirit and put it all together, we get one God, only one God, complex in his unity, to which Jesus is the number one witness. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, Dr. James White, two minutes. Thank you. Unitarianism requires us to look at the Bible with one eye closed. It says true things. We are biblical monotheists. I have stood in defense of the fact there is only one true creator God many, many times. But the reason we believe in the doctrine of the Trinity is because we look at not only Scripture alone, sola scriptura, but we look at tota scriptura, all of Scripture. And the biblical testimony is very, very clear. We have to ignore the fullness of the New Testament revelation. Remember, the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed between the Old and the New Testament in the incarnation of the Son of God and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit of God. The New Testament then becomes the very record of the religion founded in this revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity. That's why the doctrine of the Trinity simply pervades all of the New Testament records. And that's why you don't have explicit statements, but you have these statements that could not possibly be understood outside of a Trinitarian complex. And so we look at the scriptures and we see the testimony that Jesus Christ has eternally existed. He is the creator of all things. In Colossians chapter 1, when Paul is arguing against that early form of something called Gnosticism, he argues that Jesus Christ is the one who created all things, not because of him, but he is the very one for whom, in whom, and by whom all things were created. He is the one who, even before his incarnation, did not give consideration to holding on to that equality he had with God, but he set that aside, the ultimate example of humility for us, Philippians chapter 2. So when Thomas says, my Lord and my God, when Paul describes him as our great God and Savior in Titus 2.13, when Peter calls him our God and Savior in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, when, the, when the church uh, prays to him and worships him in religious context, they are simply following through with the revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity that has taken place in the incarnation and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're here this evening, to look at all of what the Scripture says with both eyes open. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I appreciate the opening statements. Uh, we're now going to turn to uh, the questions. Uh, first, uh, address to the uh, non-Trinitarian panel prepared uh, by our Trinitarian panel. First question for you gentlemen is this. After the resurrection of Jesus, people address prayers to him, while in Revelation the same praises that are offered to God are offered to him. If Jesus is only a man, wouldn't this be idolatrous? According to Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, every knee will bow to him and every tongue confess him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. How can this be said of a glorified man? Only God is to be worshipped as Lord. Gentlemen, two minutes to respond. Yes, that begs the question. If God ordains that his son can be prayed to and worshipped, in some sense not worshipped as God, then God can arrange that and I'll accept it. So it begs the question entirely. How can Jesus be worshipped and prayed and praised? A glorified man can and is being praised if God so ordained. That would be my answer. The uh, passage from 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 20 through 23, uh, you're referencing the uh, book of Revelation chapter 5, where you have the, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world in the throne of God. Uh, we have a similar passage there in the Tanakh. 
It says, uh, Then David said to all the assembly, Now bless the Lord your God. So all the assembly blessed the Lord God of their fathers, bowed their heads, prostrated themselves before the Lord and the king, and they made sacrifices to the Lord, offered burnt offerings to the Lord on the next day, a thousand bulls, and it goes on. So they ate and drank before the Lord with great gladness on that day, and they made Solomon the son of David king the second time, and anointed him before the Lord to be the leader, and Zadok to be the priest. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father and prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. And that's an example that's very similar to what we have in the setting of Revelation chapter 5. And so there you have uh, the same type of setting. You have uh, the, uh, the king is sitting on the throne, but it's called the throne of the Lord. Thank you very much. Our Trinitarian panel, your uh, rebuttal, 90 seconds. Okay, I'll, I'll begin quickly. Uh, first, the, the parallels are not there between First Chronicles 29. There's no question you can bow down before a king and the Lord. There's certain things you can do before both. But these words, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever, that cannot be to a man. Otherwise, God is contradicting what he said over and over and over, that to him alone is that type of worship, adoration. And the man was not called God as Jesus was after his resurrection, nor addressed as God. So, so parallels hardly work at all. Not only that, but at the end of Revelation chapter 5, you'll notice that every created thing worships he who sits upon the throne and the lamb, excluding the lamb from the realm of created things. Not only that, but the, the question uh, mentioned Philippians chapter 2, the Carmen Christi, and at the end of that section, you have Paul quoting from Isaiah, where, where there it says, God says, my glory I will not give to another, and yet here you have that same glory being given to Jesus, so at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every knee will bow in the Old Testament to God, here every knee bows to Jesus. Clearly, the context is that of truly heavenly worship, which is to be given only to God. And in fact, the verse that Paul applies in Philippians 2, in, in Isaiah 45, says every tongue will confess, every knee will bow and confess to Yahweh, and here it is to Jesus. Either there is an identification between the two, or we have idolatry. Okay, your response, gentlemen, 90 seconds. Uh, I want to read the, uh, an article out of the Jewish Encyclopedia. This is uh, uh, called Agent Shliach. The main point of the Jewish law of agency is expressed in the dictum, a person's agent is regarded as the person himself. That's from uh, we have several quotes from the Talmud. Therefore, any act committed by a duly appointed agent is regarded as having been committed by the principal, who therefore b bears full responsibility for it with consequence, so forth. Now, an agent was given as much power, he was allowed to work as much power as was, was given to him. In the scriptures, it tells us over and over that all power was given to Yeshua. He is the agent. He is the Messiah. He is in... Uh, every way that he, he comes, he acts in, in the name of Hashem. And I, I think that's the context for what we have here. Anything to add to that? Topic? Yes, back to the point about worship. David was worshipped alongside with God. Same word, proskineo. I'm using modern Greek pronunciation, not mispronouncing the Greek. Worship was given to David. Please note in the text that my colleague read. That's very important. There is a Greek word, latrevo, to do religious service to, to someone, which is not used of Jesus in the New Testament. That's significant. But again, the question is begged all the time. If God ordains that his immortalized son as lamb, as sinless lamb, human being, is to be worshipped and praised, so be it. I would, ask, I, would, I would suggest it's the devil, you see, who is not keen on man being elevated to that sort of height. But if the, te if the text says that Jesus is praised, then I would accept Thank that. Thank you very much. A final rebuttal, 90 seconds. Yeah, scripture is so clear over and over and over that man is not exalted to the place of God and that no flesh glories in his presence. And yet these gentlemen are telling us that a flesh creature will receive the glory that is only due to God. That's a heretical, dangerous position. Not only so, Jesus is worshipped because of his actual nature. They, they, the, the demon said, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. And sacrifices were not offered to a man. They were only offered to God. Distinctions were made. You hear the same praise that goes to God goes to the Lamb. And not only that, but we need to recognize in the book of Revelation that when uh, John tried to bow down and give proskuneo, worship the angel, in a religious context, the angel said, do not do that, worship only God. 
the worship Jesus receives is not merely that which you would bow down before an earthly leader. It is always in the context of religious worship, which is reserved to God alone. And once again, the identity of Jesus as Yahweh on the part of the New Testament writers that is intimately connected with this worship demonstrates that the Old Testament prohibition against the worship of anything in the religious context but Yahweh himself would be very important at this point as well. And that's why the scriptures emphasize that Jesus, John 13, came from God, was returning to God. John 6, that he came down from heaven. We worship him because he is the exalted eternal son, not simply because of some non-existent text somewhere that says God appointed a man to receive the worship and adoration and service only due to God. Thank you very much. Uh, now our first question addressed to our Trinitarian panel from our non-Trinitarian panel. How many Lord, yud Hey vav Hayes, is the Trinitarian position proposing? Not just how many gods, but how many yud Hey vav Hayes is the Trinitarian position proposing? Two minutes. There's one Yahweh. Scripture's quite clear about that. Yahweh is, is complex in his unity, which is why in Genesis chapter 18, Yahweh, quite explicitly in Hebrew, is dialoguing with Abraham and Sarah here, on the earth, one Yahweh, the same Yahweh who sits enthroned in heaven. So the, the scripture is unambiguous about that, that there's one God only, one Yahweh only, and also there is one Father, one Son, one Spirit, who is all part of this one God, the way he's made himself known. So there's no ambiguity, no mystery, no difficulty, one Yahweh, complex in his unity, the overall testimony of scripture. It is very important to recognize that the Greek term kurios is used of Jesus as his primary designation in the New Testament, and that is the very term that is used to render the divine name, the tetragrammaton, in the Old Testament, Yahweh, which is the specific identification of God. So in these texts in the New Testament that identify Jesus as Yahweh, we have inspired commentary that tells us exactly who Jesus is. We have Old Testament texts that tell us that Yahweh places the sins of his people upon the Messiah, and so clearly the Father is identified as Yahweh, and yet Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, John chapter 12, there are numerous places where Jesus is identified as Yahweh, and of course the Spirit is the Spirit of Yahweh. So we have one name, and we have to allow all of the New Testament texts to speak. We can't start with the presupposition of Unitarianism and say, well, I'm going to enforce this upon the text. We have to allow the text to instruct us, and we have to allow for what took place between the Testaments in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, this great event, which then forms the very matrix of the New Testament revelation itself. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Our uh, non-Trinitarian panel, 90 seconds. If you uh, identify rebuttal. Jesus as Yahweh, and you identify the Father as Yahweh, I leave you to count out how many Yahwehs there are there. You identify Jesus as Yahweh, and you identify the Father as Yahweh, I think that makes two Yahwehs, that's dangerous. If you then say all three together are Yahweh, <laughs> you've got another use of Yahweh. So you've got Yahweh X is Jesus, another X, the Father is Yahweh, Holy Spirit is also Yahweh, that's another X. Those three X's make one X, because they're calling, my colleagues, my good colleagues here are calling all three together Yahweh. This word Yahweh is, is finding lots of reference, and I find that too difficult. Jesus said clearly, there's only one Lord, one Kyrios. He never claimed to be Yahweh. He claimed to be Yahweh's agent, and he claimed to be the Lord Messiah of Psalm 110.1, which governs the whole of our discussion, or should. Michael, you referenced in uh, Genesis 18 that uh, where Hashem spoke to Abraham, and uh, you said that th uh, this very clearly was, was Hashem there speaking directly to him. Uh, for 2,000 years, up to the time of Yeshua, or 1,500 years up to the time of Yeshua, the Jewish people never identified it in that manner. Uh, to this day, they still do not identify it in that manner. You're changing how these are looked at, these passages are looked at from the way they have been through the ages, through the centuries. Now, when Yeshua came, he, he, he didn't come. This isn't something that he came and said, look, you've missed it. You've been misunderstanding everything. This isn't something that was addressed that we have in the in the New Testament. Yeah, just to, to reply to that directly, uh, Joe, with all respect, you completely uh, misrepresented the Jewish position in that we don't have Jewish texts talking about Genesis 18 between the time it was written and the time of Yeshua. That's number one. 
Number two, Jesus did tell him to correct things. And he said, this is the father that you haven't known. You've read the scriptures and haven't seen him. And he made explicit identification of himself with Yahweh, John 8, 58, which I'm sure will come to before Abraham was, I am. Uh, not only so, Jewish scholars today, uh, Benjamin Summer, professor at Jewish Theological Seminary, says the plain reading of Genesis 18 is quite clear about Yahweh appearing in bodily form, and that any Jew faithful to scripture and Jewish tradition should have no problem with the Trinity. You should also check the Talmudic discussion of Genesis 18 because it points in this very direction of an identification, physical identification of Yahweh with the one who is there. But I'm beholden to the scriptural text, which is quite clear, but I wanted to correct the misrepresentation that you just gave. Not only that, but the scriptural text tells us in John 12, 41, after a citation of Isaiah 6, 10 in Isaiah's temple vision, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. The only his in the context is Jesus. If you ask Isaiah, who did you see in your temple vision, Isaiah's response would be, I saw Yahweh. If you ask John, who did you see, his response is Jesus. How can a monotheistic Jew who says the Shema identify a mere man as the one seen by Isaiah in his temple vision of Yahweh sitting upon his throne? One Yahweh, quite simple. You may make it difficult. It's quite simple for me. Complex in his unity because he's God. He's not a rock. He's almighty God, complex in his unity. Thank you. 90-second uh, response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One Yahweh is not so. If you're going to say Jesus is identified as Yahweh, that's one Yahweh. Now let's identify the Father as Yahweh. That's two Yahwehs. Now the third one is Yahweh. You've got three Yahwehs. You can go on saying all three together are Yahweh also, and I see that's your understanding, but you're identifying each of the three as X, as Yahweh, and you're then telling me that all three together are still X. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. And I don't think it did to Jesus because a Jew agreed with Jesus in Mark 12, 28. Proved to me that that Jewish scribe was a Trinitarian, and I'm with you. But unless one can do that, I don't understand anyth anything about complex unity. I don't find that in any dictionary, any language that I ever learned. knows nothing about complex unity at all. Echad means one, one single. Check any lexicon. So all of this complexity about unity is meaningless to me until explained much more fully than you've done so far. You haven't had a chance to do it yet. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the next question addressed to our uh, non-Trinitarians by our Trinitarian panel. Another Yahweh question. The Tetragrammaton and passages like Genesis 18, Yahweh appears to his people in the Old Testament in visible form and even talks with them face to face. Yet the New Testament teaches that no one has seen God. How do you reconcile these two truths? Continuation of the same discussion. Two minutes, gentlemen. The way that I see this, what he saw, what came and addressed him was a shiliach. It was uh, an agent, uh, an angel of the Lord that was representing. And we had this throughout the scriptures, throughout the Tanakh, uh, throughout Jewish understanding. Big, a big difference I see between the Western world and the Eastern world is that the, uh, the context of the agent uh, is an overwhelming uh, context. And it, it explains to me uh, most uh, of the passages that we have in the scripture, we have many, many times where it, where it talks about the angel of the Lord wrestling with, with Jacob. We have the angel of the Lord appearing to, to different ones, and, uh, uh, but it'll have in the context that Hashem is there. But it's, a, it's an agent, and that is just the, uh, the way that we have other scriptures. Rebuttal? You know, the problem I have with that is that the Bible could not possibly say it any more clearly. You simply can't accept it, therefore you have to reinterpret it. Genesis 18, in any plain reading, Yahweh along with two angels appears. The two angels go on to Sodom. Abraham stays with Yahweh. And it's him explicitly. It doesn't say an angel. It doesn't say Malach Adonai or anything like that. Isaiah 6, Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up. He says, Oily, kinid meti. I'm undone. The, the, the seraphim cry out, Kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzvaot. They're worshiping Yahweh. And, and John 12 explicitly says that that's the one that Isaiah saw, who is Jesus. And we can't get away from that. Exodus, the 24th chapter, they saw the God of Israel and yet he didn't smite them. That's not a vision that's actually seeing him. These things are quite explicit. If no one has seen God at any time, and these people saw him, who did they see? They saw the Son, the one through whom the Father is made known. It's wonderful. It's scriptural. It's true. It's exactly what the Apostle John writes to us at the end of his prologue of John 1.18. No one has ever seen God. The monogenes theos, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has exegeted him. He has made him known. He has revealed him. 
I submit to you that a mere man who came into existence at a point in time in Bethlehem cannot be the one who exegetes, who gives a perfect revelation of the infinite God. The writer of the Hebrews said that Jesus is the exact representation of his being. Uh, that is too big a category for a mere creature. Uh, this one is identified as Yahweh. That is the way we must understand it. Okay, 90 seconds to respond. Yeah, the, the mere creature. I, I hope you'll catch that word, mere. It begs the question all the time. If God ordains that his supreme, sinless lamb can do all these things, so be it. He's not a mere creature. He's not just a man. He's a, a unique man. But back to the angel of the Lord, Stephen, you know, did not identify that angel of the Lord as the son. He did not. He said an angel spoke to Moses. I would start with Stephen there. I would also go to Judges 16, where you'll find that the angel of the Lord is distinguished from Yahweh. If you want to offer a sacrifice to Yahweh, do it, said the angel of the Lord. He's not himself. The angel of the Lord is not, is not Jesus pre-existing because you can't see God. So it makes no sense to say Jesus is God, but they saw him. And let's say that again. <laughs> You can't see God. Nobody's seen God and lived. So don't tell me then that the Son of God was there. He is God, and they saw him. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So I don't think the writer of Hebrews was wrong when he said God spoke through a son only in these last days, not before. Hebrews 1, 2, very important text. Over and over, uh, there's just piles of passages, uh, New Testament and the Tanakh of the Shliach, of the sent one. Now, uh, over and over, Yeshua makes statements. In fact, in the book of John, he says, I am the sent one from God. Over and over, he referenced God as his God. Um, he, um, in the role of the Shliach, he is totally representing Hashem. When you see him, you see the Father. He is the, the image. I agree with what you said. He's the same essence of the Father. He is the perfect image of the Father. And uh, when you say a mere man, I don't see him as a mere man. He's as the first Adam. He's as the first yeah. Adam. Time up. Uh, final response, 90 seconds. The fact is, you say he's created, therefore he is mortal. And the scriptures are quite clear that he is preexistent. Uh, it's f so fascinating that the text you quoted are the ones we didn't quote. <laughs> you quoted from Exodus 3 and Judges 16 that make reference to the angel. We weren't quoting that. We were quoting Genesis 18, which you haven't touched yet in terms of truly answering that, Exodus 24, Isaiah, the sixth chapter, those are quite explicit. Uh, and, and when you talk about Achad earlier, let's just remember Genesis 2.24, when Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, the two become one. When the tabernacle is built in Exodus 35, that all of the pieces together become one tabernacle. Echad simply means one, and the God we worship is one, complex in his unity. I'm simply putting scripture together and saying, I believe what's written. I don't have to come up with all these different ways out, because I accept what's written. It's, it's, it's again, very simple. And as John said, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. That's a very straightforward passage. I think we need to have an exegesis of Isaiah 6 and John 12. If you're going to say, well, it's not really Yahweh, it's just someone representing Yahweh, how can that be his glory? It's very important to understand. You must listen to the presuppositions that are being brought to this discussion. You can't simply assume Unitarianism. I believe uh, that the gentlemen across the table are assuming Unitarianism, rather than proving Unitarianism, both Unitarianism and Trinitarianism must derive itself from the inspired words of Scripture. It can't simply be assumed and then read into the text itself. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question addressed to our Trinitarian panel from our non-Trinitarians. In the time frame from Adam to the first century, did the Jewish people view God as existing in a triune form, God the Father, Son, Messiah? and Holy Spirit. Two minutes. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of Jewish literature uh, that's, that's extant, that gets into theological discussion. Uh, certainly it affirms the oneness of God. I affirm that. You, you may challenge that, but I'm affirming the same thing Yeshua affirmed and the same thing Paul affirmed and the same thing Isaiah affirmed. Uh, it, most of the discussion uh, has to do with either legal issues, which you'll find in Dead Sea Scrolls and discussion there, or, or other uh, eschatological issues but there, there certainly, as far back as we can go in Jewish tradition, uh, as it begins to evolve after the time of Jesus, we find things like the Shekhinah, the manifest presence of God on the earth. We, we find a developing theory of the Sfirot, which, which are the, uh, the emanations of God. Because there's the constant question, how can the infinite, eternal, invisible God 
be manifest and touchable on the earth. So we have the answer through the gospel, the wonderful good news that the Son came into the world and revealed God to us as the sent one, of course. Uh, but uh, other Jewish literature then begins to react against this in the centuries that follow. But I would agree with Professor Benjamin Sommer that any Jew who's true to the scriptures and Jewish tradition should have no problem with God's triunity. And I think we also need to look at the indications of that that are found in the Old Testament. I believe that the actual revelation takes place in the incarnation and in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's when it actually takes place. But when you describe uh, that one in Isaiah as El Gabor, and in the very next chapter, describe Yahweh as El Gabor, uh, you can't just simply say, well, that's a mighty hero or something like that. There are indications there in the prophecies. Uh, of the one who was to come and what his nature was going to be. A son who is, who is born to us, a, a child who is born to us, a son who is given to us. I think that's very significant as well. But I believe that the actual revelation of this takes place in the incarnation and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Just as we're told, Paul writes to Timothy, that life and immortality are brought to life through the gospel. So that which was revealed in part in the Hebrew Scriptures is now revealed in full in the New Covenant Scriptures. Thank you. Rebuttal? I've got a book here, uh, Nazarene Jewish Christianity. Ray Pritz, I don't know if you've seen it before. Uh, it goes into the church fathers. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Epiphanius. Epiphanius, okay. Uh, in 347, he began writing a work called the Panorium. Uh, in this, he references the Jewish believers in Yeshua that have moved from, uh, from Judea to the region of Pella. Now they've been there all this time. They survived there up into the 500s. Now in 374 he made this statement about them. He says uh, that they're trained in the law and circumcision, Sabbath. With regard to Messiah, with regard to Messiah they believe that he is a mere man uh, and they emphatically declared that he was born of the Holy Spirit from Mary. Now this is one of the earliest references that we have in this more or less blank period. But it appears that the Jewish believers, and these are the believers that, that descended from the Jerusalem church, that they believed that he was a man, uh, that, he, that he was not God come in the flesh. Uh, they did believe he was the Messiah. They believed he was the anointed one of God. They believed that he was sent and empowered by God uh, above and beyond uh, any other uh, person, creature, whatever, that he was given the power that was given to Adam in the beginning and that he's raised uh, from the dead and uh, that he is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Thank you. 90 second response. Yeah, once again, with all respect, I have to correct you. Uh, Ray Pritz is dealing with several different Jewish groups, the Ebionites, the Corinthians, and the Nazarenes, and Epiphanius' reference is to one of the heretical groups. Those groups were called heretical. According to Ray Pritz, the Nazarenes were ones who held to what we would call the orthodox doctrine about the pre-existence of Jesus, etc. Some of the other groups denied the authority of Paul. They denied other issues. So that quote is one of the references to one of the heretical groups, and the Nazarenes were ones that we would call orthodox. This quote was to the Nazarenes. And if, and if you'd like to hear what the early church said, for example, Ignatius writing around 107 to 108 A.D. refers to our God, Jesus Christ, being in the Father is more plainly seen. His epistle to the Romans, Romans 3. To the Smyrnians, he said, I glorified Jesus Christ, the God who gave you such wisdom. And this is one of my favorite descriptions of Jesus Christ found in Ignatius. Again, this is the first generation after the apostles. There is one physician of flesh and of spirit, generate and ingenerate, God and man, true life and death, both from Mary and from God, first passable and then impassable, Jesus Christ our Lord. There you have the very two natures of Christ being laid out. These early Christians believed in the preexistence of Christ. They described him as God. Uh, that is the testimony that Ignatius gives us, and we could look at others as well. Final response, 90 seconds. Uh, yes, back to a little history. We're throwing in some history here. So Isaac Newton would be pleased with what this side of the table is saying. John Milton, the three brightest brains of that century. Isaac Newton, and of course the famous hymn writer, Isaac Watts, who became a Unitarian uh, towards the end of his life, the other one, John Locke. So it's not just a, a very small group of people who are not distinguished who believe this. But, you know, on the point of uh, pre-existence here, I'm amazed that we don't go immediately to Matthew and Luke. You don't do calculus before you've done algebra, I gather, from your excellent book there. Let's start at the beginning and talk about the begetting of the Messiah. When was he begotten? Go to Matthew, go to Luke. Don't go to John. You do that later. Go to Matthew, go to Luke, 
And it's very clear that the Son of God was begotten. And that word beget, yanao in modern Greek, in the modern Greek pronunciation, yanao means to bring into existence, to give existence to. So a child reading that says, my goodness, Mary had a baby, a new Son of God came into existence. Nothing about that Son of God coming from outside the womb. That's very Gnostic and strange. 30 seconds more. Oh, 30 seconds more. Same after. Go ahead. Oh, wonderful. So, Matthew and Luke are to precede in your studies, I suggest, ladies and gentlemen. Precede John. This argument is going to be from John almost entirely. And isolated verses from John. Why not go to the beginning and the end of John? John wrote the whole book to, to prove he's the son of God, the Messiah, and he introduces the son as the king of Israel at the beginning. But Matthew and Luke were written to offset the ideas that my good friends here are giving us, that there was a pre-existing son who entered the womb of Mary. Very Thank strange. You. Uh, next question, uh, addressed to our non-Trinitarian panel from our Trinitarians. Jesus explicitly refers to his pre-existence in numerous passages in the New Testament, stating that he came from God and was returning to God, that he came down from heaven and would return to heaven, that he enjoyed glory together with God his Father before the world began. On what scriptural grounds do you deny his pre-existence? Two minutes. Great question. If you're reading the NIV, you're being misled. Uh, let me say that slowly. If you're reading the NIV, you're being misled. No text says that Jesus returned to God. Does it? You know the difference between ipostrefo, to return, and porevome, to go? Check it out carefully. No text, except in the NIV, which is misleading, it says that Jesus returned to God, point one. John the Baptist Again. was sent by, from God. John the Baptist was sent from God. Jesus said in John... 751, my flesh came down from heaven. I want you to think about that very carefully. My flesh came down from heaven. And think about what sort of language we're using. Is this literal or metaphorical? Go carefully with John. Do your homework first in Matthew and Luke and put your stake in Matthew and Luke first. Anything to add to that, Joseph? Mm. Um, rebuttal, 90 seconds. I think it's very important to allow Jesus himself to answer this question. When praying to the Father in John chapter 17, he says, And now, Father... Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, Sir Anthony, I've listened very carefully to your MP3s, your presentations. I've tried to understand your position quite accurately. You have often said if you use a pronoun, you are a person, you're a singular person. Yeah. Well, here Jesus uses a pronoun, and he says, with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, this is a person who is speaking of a situation that existed before creation in which he was glorious in the presence of the Father. If that is not indication of the pre-existence of Christ and his own understanding of his pre-existence, I don't know what could possibly fulfill any kind of, of rule uh, that would give us any text that would prove that Jesus Christ is pre-existent. These are the words of Jesus. I think we need to believe what they say. John 13, 3, he came from God and was going to God. Mm -hmm. Mm. Call that returning, based on the Greek. He came from, he's going back. He Not repeatedly that. said, he came from heaven. Not only so, Matthew 23, to quote Matthew, that Jesus had been longing to gather the people of Jerusalem to himself for a long period of time. This is historic. Luke uh, points it to God's wisdom pre-existing, okay? So, uh, and the, the constant phrase, I have come, I have come. Again, Jesus says to himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega, pre-existence. Thank you. Response, 90 seconds. Yes, I have come. Nicodemus said to Jesus, we know that you've come from God. Did Nicodemus think he was a pre-existing Messiah? I don't think so. Coming from God doesn't tell you anything about whether you were alive from eternity. So that doesn't work as an argument. Uh, the other point was wisdom. Jesus is the wisdom of God. He's what wisdom became. He's what word became. Not one to one equal with pre existent son. That's the trick. He is the wisdom of God. Walking wisdom. He's the walking word of God. The expression of God tells you nothing about when he started. Go back to Matthew. Go back to Luke and find out when he was begotten, brought into existence. And that's the key to the whole thing. Still have time left. In the, uh, there's a, an ancient debate of which, uh, uh, an ancient uh, ruling. It was handed down in uh, different versions, enumerating six or seven persons or things created before the world came into existence. Number one, the Torah, which is the first, uh, called the, the firstling of his way. Number two, the throne of glory, which is established of old. Number three, the sanctuary. Uh, number four, the patriarchs. I'm going to go on down. Number six is the Messiah. Before the Son, his name sprouts forth as ye known, the awakener. Uh, 
Uh, uh, what I submit is that the references that we have, they're in this context, that it's only at a later time that we, uh, we move away and the church starts to look at it in a different fashion, in a different mode. I don't know how that can be in light of the fact that Jesus' own prayer in John 17, 5 shows his own self-consciousness of his eternal preexistence as a glorious being in the presence of the Father. We need an answer to John 17, 5. Mm -hmm. But I would like to point out for Sir Anthony very quickly that in the Greek of John 13, 3, when you have a pa followed by pros, and then you have hupagai, that's why translations that are fine translations say going back, because you have the two prepositions there. So it's, I, I, think, I think you're being unfair if you say it's a mistranslation. In, in addition to that, let, let's keep looking at the evidence. Genesis 18 was clear about the, pre the, the appearance of Yahweh in fleshly form. Isaiah chapter 6 is clear ab about Isaiah seeing Yahweh slash Jesus. Those things haven't been touched. John 1, 3, that says all things were made through the word. Who is this word? Hebrews 1 tells us it's the Son. Colossians 1 tells us it's the Son. 1 Corinthians 8 tells us it's the Son. The, the testimony is so explicit overwhelming. Now, here's the other thing. James, moments ago, quoted from the first generation of disciples who identified Jesus as divine. You, sir, uh, Joe, are quoting from later rabbinic texts, hundreds of years later, that deny the deity of the Messiah and blaming us uh, for, for making up tradition or following tradition. It's quite the contrary. We're following the biblical witness. You're saying, but no Jew could possibly believe it, based on writing centuries later. Again, the biblical witness is so clear and overwhelming. And, and I really do appeal to you to recognize your supreme error on denying the pre-existence of the Son, the one that Hebrews 1 tells us in the beginning created the universe. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question uh, for our Trinitarian experts from our non-Trinitarian panel, uh, did Yeshua directly present and teach others that God existed with the triune nature and that he himself was the triune God the Son? Two minutes. Well, not obviously using that specific terminology, but look at the things that Jesus did. First of all, he distinguished himself from the Father, yet he identified himself and did things that only God can possibly do. We saw in John chapter 17, his prayer that is found there, the claims that he made for himself, the fact that he accepted worship. And so he did things that indicated his own recognition of his own deity. And then in the commissioning of the disciples, sent them out in, and said to baptize in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I wish we had time to walk through, for example, John chapter 5, where Jesus emphasized the unity that exists between He and the Father, the fact that He's not off on His own. He's not off doing things as some separate God. The unity that exists between He and the Father. He says, I do nothing op eautu, hey eautu, from myself. But of course, none of the divine persons do something separate from, in distinction to, in contradiction to the other divine persons. And so the, the, the terminology isn't the issue. The fact that Jesus acts as the God of Israel and he speaks in that way, and he even says, you've heard it said of old, the words of God, I say unto you, all of these things indicate that clearly he views himself in that way and wishes his disciples to view himself in that way as well. And there, there are other verses as well. Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he'll obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And then he speaks of the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Uh, bear in mind also in John 5 and John 8, the Jewish hearers then took up stones to stone him. They wanted to kill him because of his very explicit identification with God. That's what they heard to the point of wanting to kill him. And when Thomas says to him, my Lord and my God, he doesn't rebuke him or say you're misguided. And yes, we put together the truth that the Father is Jesus God and that Jesus himself is God. God, complex in his unity, the scriptural witness which we are beholden to. Thank you. Gentlemen, two minutes, or 90 seconds to, uh, for rebuttal. One, one comment uh, on the passage with John uh, where Thomas addresses uh, my Lord and my, my God. Uh, the word that is used there in Greek is, uh, is the counterpart to Elohim, which is uh, used not only for God, but used for angels. It's used for mighty men. It's used for judges. Uh, so you can't make a case that he was saying, my Lord and my God. <clears throat> Not in that passage. John 17, 5. Glorify me with the glory I had in prospect. Augustine, the great Trinitarian, and Calvin's theologian agreed with us on that point. So do not assume 
that when you say, give me the glory now that I had with you, you can have something in prospect. You have a reward with the Lord, it says in Matthew 6, 1. You have it. In the future, you will say, give me now the body which I have. Paul says, you have an internal body now. You have it. In the future, you'll say, now give me the body that I had with you. Simply read as a Jew. Do not read as a Western uh, American. And we'll understand John 17, 5 properly. I can't imagine how anyone hearing John 17, 5 originally would have read the word in prospect into what Jesus was saying, especially when in prayer he's saying, glorify me if you're just merely a human being who was uh, supernaturally begotten. But I must respond and, and refute the, the falsehood that was just presented to you. Uh, Thomas said, That's the exact terminology used in Psalm 35, 23, 34, 23 in the Greek Septuagint, uh, as well as in Psalm 16, both about Yahweh. Uh, the idea that theos here, has anything to do with a mere angel. Um, if, if, if we looked at someone and said, my Lord and my God, at their resurrection, and then they said, have you believed because of this? Identifying it as faith? Uh, the idea that kurios and theos could be put together, and that's an angel, utterly impossible in the text. There's not a single instance in the New Testament where theos, God, is used the way you're arguing, and in particular in, in John. So that, that's a complete impossibility of interpretation there. Uh, not only so, Jesus says, believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. What a wonderful description of God's unity expressed in Father and Son. Uh, you know, the constant mantra I'm hearing about, read this through Jewish eyes and not through Western eyes. I am Jewish. I've studied with Jewish scholars. I immerse myself in Jewish literature. And there's, there's no possible way you could read this as written, or if it was originally spoken in Hebrew or Aramaic, whatever, and, and come to other conclusions. That, to me, is a Western reading, trying to put something on a text that the text won't bear. And even the alleged contradictions you can't bear, that, to me, sounds very Western. Yeah, it's and it's thinking, as opposed to a Semitic way, which would have no problem with these types of concepts. Socinianism is not Western. It's quite modern. It's quite rationalistic. Okay, thank you. Final uh, uh, rebuttal. Yes. My response would be that Augustine was quite a clever Trinitarian, and he does not agree with you. Nor did Calvin's very sophisticated theologian. They don't read it that way, they read it our way. In the very context in John 17, if you look at verse 22 and 24, Jesus says that you, I'm addressing the audience, you people weren't even born. Give that same glory to you. You weren't alive. It's glory in prospect in that very context. And I have a whole range of scholars, I can't read them, not with respect to agreeing with you at all. That's glory and prospect. Give me now the glory. At the end of my ministry, give me the reward of the glory which I had in your great plan in prospect. And that same glory has been given to you in AD 30. You weren't even born. In the 14th chapter of John, Thomas failed to see. If, you, if you've seen me, you've seen God. Don't you get it? He didn't get it. If you've seen me, you've seen God. He finally got it. My Lord Messiah and my God indeed. I see God in you, of course. That's the only second time that he's called God in the whole New Testament. 1,300 times the Father is called God. 1,300 Unitarian statements. Twice for sure Jesus is called God. There it is. I see finally my God in you. Atheos mu. Very good. Next question uh, addressed to our non-Trinitarians from our Trinitarians. On several occasions in the New Testament, both in the Gospels and in the Epistles, Jesus is explicitly called God. How do you explain these verses, the grammatical meaning of, uh, of most of which is quite straightforward? Two minutes. Okay, I would, I would argue that Jesus is called God once for sure. In the Psalm 45 quoted in Hebrews 1.8, Thy throne, O God. Immediately there's a God on top of him, by the way. And you, his God has given him that throne. I, I'll grant that one. Scholars will argue till the cows come home. We don't want to bore you with grammatical and syntactical issues in the other verses that claim that Jesus is called God. I don't think they're valid at all. Most, many Trinitarians I could cite you do not think he's called God in the other seven or eight text. So that's a matter of grammatical debate, and it's rather tedious. He's not called God. The Father's called God 1,300 times. That, those are Unitarian statements, every one of them, and I find that rather simple. Joseph? My, uh, my statement goes back to the same thing, that he, he says, I came in the name of the Father. He represents the Father in everything that he does, that he is basically the agent of the Father. Everything that he does, he says, I do nothing of myself, that uh, what I do is what the Father gave me to do, what He's empowered me to do. Well, the faith of believers is found in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, it's not obscure grammar and syntax to emphasize that here the Apostle Paul identifies Jesus as God and Savior. 
Uh, this is pointed out in two different ways. First of all, not only can we make a very strong argument based upon the Greek text that Jesus is described both as God and Savior here, and I would refer you to Dan Wallace's fine work on this particular subject, but the context demonstrates that that is the only way to understand Titus chapter 2. You only have one person in view in Titus chapter 2. And when verse 14 goes on to say, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works, those texts are all Yahweh texts from the Old Testament about the covenant God of Israel. Psalm 130 verse 8, Ezekiel 37, 23, Exodus 19, 5. These are all about the things that Yahweh would do being applied to Jesus. So does it make any sense whatsoever to say, well, in this text, Jesus could not be called God and Savior when the very next sentence, part of the sentence, identifies Jesus as Yahweh. Jesus is identified as God over and over again in the New Testament. Uh, when you mention Hebrews uh, 1.8, quite explicit, your throne, O God, mm. is forever and ever, quoting from Psalm 45.7. And then you say there's another God on top of it. It sounds as if you're talking about two gods. I'm holding to one God. Uh, let, let, me, let me go beyond that and say that as you continue reading, it says about the Son, he says, you, O Lord, in the beginning, in the beginning, just like John 1.1, 1, 1, created, made the universe. That will wear out. So it, it, there are many explicit verses. Thank you. Uh, response? Two, 90 seconds. Yes. There are lots of Yahweh texts in the Old Testament that apply to Jesus. He's his, his shaliach, his agent. Everything that Yahweh does in the Old, Jesus can do in the New. It doesn't make him Yahweh. There's only one Yahweh. We keep talking about two Yahwehs. It's very difficult. Only one Yahweh. That's the Father. Jesus does all this Yahweh stuff, the God stuff in the New Testament, searches the hearts and the minds. Of course, as shaliach is empowered to do it. That's wonderful. So I don't accept any of these arguments that this makes him literally Yahweh. He's representing Yahweh. If Joe sends me out on a job, I am Joe in Hebrew thinking. Not Joe, but Joe. Final rebuttal. You know, if, if Joe sends you and you are Joe, mm -hmm. I'm sure when you go home to snuggle with his wife in bed, she won't accept that. <laughs> so, so let's recognize that the agent is not identical to the one sending. The, the, the agent can have the authority of the one sending, but they didn't see the the alleged agent in the Old Testament, they saw God in the Old Testament who was identified as Jesus in the New. When you make reference to 1,300 references to the Father mm. that, that, that say he's God, that's the very point. It, it specifically speaks of the Father over and over and over again because of God's triunity. The primary New Testament revelation is that the Father is God and Jesus is Lord. When you look at the texts that explicitly call him God, I hope you both could say with Thomas to Jesus, my Lord and my God, when you look at them explicitly, the only answer is Trinitarian. Otherwise, we have multiple gods. You're the one creating multiple Yahwehs, not us. And you've got to understand, the description of Jesus as Yahweh in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, cannot be made of a mere man, because the attributes that are being described there from Psalm 102 are of his unchanging nature. The fact that while creation will pass away, he himself does not age. He is immutable. That cannot be applied to a mere man. It has to be applied solely to the one who was the creator of all of those things in Psalm 102 and then applied to Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1. Thank you very much. Uh, next question for our uh, Trinitarian panel. Uh, did the writers of the New Testament define and explain that Jesus was part of a triune Godhead and that people are required to believe God exists in this form? If they didn't, who did and when? Two minutes. They were quite explicit in their witness, which when we put together, we understand speaks of God's triunity. When Jesus instructs uh, immersion to be in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, that is a triune statement. When the end of 2 Corinthians 13 ends with a benediction, including Father, Son, and Spirit, that's a triune statement. When John quite explicitly tells us in John 1, 1 that what God was, the Word was, and this Word, not a thing, but a person who came to earth and manifested, made known the one true God. We're required to believe that witness. And it was certainly understood clearly enough by the angelic host, by every created being in Revelation 5 that falls down and worships this one. Revelation 22 tells us there's one throne for God and the Lamb, and His servants will serve Him forever. One God Father, Son, Spirit, quite explicit in the New Testament, because we must believe what's written, therefore we must believe these truths. And I think in answer to the question, uh, who defined this, I, I, I think the church goes back to Jesus' own statement in John chapter 5, verse 23, 
that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. If you do not have the Son, you do not have the Father, is what John says in his short epistle as well. And so those who are trying to uh, eliminate Jesus, to either say he did not truly come in human flesh, there was no true incarnation, uh, or to present a Jesus who is less than truly God, Paul argues against them in the book of Colossians, all of those would run directly up against the biblical revelation that you cannot have God the Father if you do not believe the revelation he's made of himself in God the Son. And that's, I think, where the concern that we have even to this day continues to come from. Therefore, whoever denies the Son denies the Father, denies the father as well. Right. Okay. Gentlemen, your rebuttal, 90 seconds. I just have one comment. You're interpreting that, that whoever has, that denies the Son, meaning denies that he's God. I take it that it's saying whoever denies that he's the Redeemer, that he's the Savior, that he's the Messiah that came forth and accomplished the work that he was sent forth to do. And I don't see anything in there that says that, uh, that you have to believe that he is God. Yeah, if we go to Matthew and Luke, I want to go back always to Matthew and Luke. Jesus said, God made them male and female. He never claimed to be the creator of heaven and earth, ever, nowhere. Uh, the Lord God, Yahweh, made heaven and earth by himself. We know the text in Isaiah 44. That's quite clear. There are 50 texts that plain say, plainly say that Yahweh, with one single Yahweh, <laughs> we're losing that so quickly, made the heavens and earth. It wasn't Jesus. God made them male and fem female, not himself. In Hebrews 4.4, 4, he, God, rested on the seventh day, not Jesus. Notice the assumption of Unitarianism that Sir Anthony just gave us in Isaiah 44.24, a text I've heard him use many, many times that I use many times in debating my, my Mormon friends. Isaiah 44, 24 does say that Yahweh alone created the heavens and the earth. If you assume Unitarianism and ignore all the New Testament references to Jesus as Yahweh and then ignore the New Testament reference to the fact that by him were all things created, whether in heaven and earth, visible or invisible, principalities, powers, dominions, authorities, all things created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Then you can come up with that position. But if you allow for all of those texts, then you see that, yes, Yahweh alone created Father, Son, and Spirit. That's why all are identified as agents of creation in the New Testament. Final uh, response? Uh, I would say that uh, the reference to, that you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, that this is a triune statement, uh, meaning that, that it, it shows the Trinity. Uh, I don't see that in that passage at all. I see that it's talking of the Father, it's talking of his son that he sent, and it's talking of the power by which it was accomplished that he, uh, through his spirit. And so uh, I think it's an assumption to just say, I mean, just as you're accusing us of, of, well, we're looking at it through certain eyes, you're looking at it through certain eyes also. Anything My assumption further? is that 11,000 singular personal pronouns indicate a single person, is it clear? That's my assumption. I'm saying I here. We have no trouble with it. There are 14 forms of the, of the singular personal pronoun in Hebrew, Greek, and English. 14 forms. 11,000 at least. I'm hearing a complex I. I three? I don't think so. I, 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 me, me, me. These are simple ideas. Very simple and straightforward. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a final question for uh, our non-Trinitarian experts from the Trinitarian panel uh, for part one. <laughs> Uh, Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit as a personality who would teach and guide his people and elsewhere uh, the scriptures speak <coughs> of grieving the Spirit uh, or enjoying communion with the Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? Two minutes to respond. Go ahead. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Spirit is the Spirit of God. The parallel in Luke and Matthew you have the Father's Spirit will speak through you when you're under pressure. The parallel is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of uh, my colleague here is coming to me. It's him projecting himself. It's the operational presence and power of God or Jesus indiscriminately in the New Testament. Not, I think, a third person. You don't need that. You don't need a third person. Even in 385 AD, the church fathers were undecided. Please note. They didn't know, for sure. And 385 AD. So don't tell me that triune thing was in place. It wasn't. The Holy Spirit is God's operational presence and power. God extending himself to his creation in a variety of different ways. The Holy Spirit is never worshipped and never sends any greeting. Uh, I'm trying to follow uh, the <laughs> greetings part there, but um, 
Uh, the Spirit is clearly identified as a person in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is the action of an individual. And clearly, though the New Testament differentiates between the Father, Son, and Spirit, it is the Father and the Son who together send the Spirit and by the presence of the Spirit manifest their, uh, their, their dwelling within believers. And there's clear differentiation made. Yet the Spirit is sovereign in the giving of the gifts. Uh, the Spirit is the one who brings life in raising people to spiritual life, etc., etc. So clearly the Holy Spirit is identified as a divine person uh, and uh, is identified as, as divine in these scriptures as having a human, I'm, I'm sorry, as having a will, the ability to give the gifts as he wishes. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, speaks of him as the eternal spirit. Joe, you said uh, you just made reference to him as power earlier with regard to Matthew 28 and the baptismal formula. Now, of course, he's more than power. That's why it speaks of grieving him. That's why it speaks of his will. And, Anthony, what you just did is refuted everything you've said up to now about, it's so simple, I, 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 I. And then you say God, but his spirit project you single person, and yet your spirit project, is that two people? Is that three in one? Are you body, soul, spirit? Are you multiple? I worship one God as described in Scripture, mm -hmm. Father, Son, Spirit, one mm -hmm. and only one, mm -hmm. and I only worship one. And the Holy Spirit comes in power and wills, acts, teaches, instructs. Thank you. Uh, the Holy Spirit rebuttal? is the Spirit of the Father. Let me ask you if the Spirit of Elijah is a different person from Elijah. No. Nor is the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Jesus a different person from God or Jesus. No. Massive scholarly support for what I'm saying here, by the way. I'm not making this up. The spirit of Elijah, is that another person from Elijah? No, no. It's, it's Elijah projecting himself. God projecting himself. Jesus projecting himself. That's all we need. The comforter is, in fact, identified as Jesus, too. As you know, First John 2. Do you want to add to that? Uh, I have a question in Jewish writings. Uh, do we have the wisdom? Do we have knowledge? Are these ever personified? Uh, and are they perce perceived as a deity? Actually, the, the rabbinic writings, Talmud, Midrash, have quite a few statements where the Holy Spirit is clearly personified mm -hmm. in, in such a way that's even stronger than New Testament witness and the Holy Spirit interceding with God on behalf of individuals. So the rabbinic writings actually point in this direction without them rightly even embracing what their own writings are, are saying. Mm -hmm. Not only so, I'm not saying that the Spirit of God is a separate person from God. You are. I'm saying it is one God. Father, Son, and Spirit. What's also fascinating is when you draw attention, when you draw attention to the Holy Spirit never worshipped, and we give you clear passages where Jesus is worshipped the same way with the same words that are given to the Father, you, you blow that off. So, so I mean, you, you have to have it one way or the other. Either accept that Jesus is worshipped as Lord and God in the New Testament, or, or, or not. But the parakletos, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Again, if pronouns prove something, this proves that the Holy Spirit is a person and is not simply the Spirit of the Father in the sense of just the, the Father's power or something like that. These, again, we have to be consistent in the argumentation that we're using here. And we have to allow all of Scripture to teach. We can't look at Scriptures with one eye closed and only see one part of the testimony. We have to see everything that the Scripture is saying. Thank you. And uh, the final uh, question addressed to our uh, Trinitarian panel from our non-Trinitarian experts. Where does the word God in the Bible ever mean the triune God? Two minutes to respond. Well, you know, I, I, I don't think that that's a, a, even a, a proper question, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, because we believe that God is the normal term that is used of the Father. Kurios is the normal term that is used of the Son. And so while we see many places in the Old Testament where God acts in a generic sense, where there's no, there's no indication that it's the Father doing this in opposition to the Son doing this or opposition to the Spirit doing this or anything like that, that's why we have no problem with the, the singular pronouns. God can act singly, and before the, the, the incarnation, the outpouring of the Spirit, there, there would be, what else would he would use? Would he use plural pronouns? Uh, well, I, don't, I don't understand how that would work, so I don't see why that is even an argument. In fact, I would like to point out, I don't see that it's an argument that 1,300 times uh, the Father is called God. How many times is he called Lord? Kurios is the more specific identification of the name of God in the Old Testament. Theos is the very generic term Elohim, which is used 
of pagan gods and everything else. Does that somehow make an argument? I, I, I don't know. But the, the fact of the matter is, the os is used primarily of the father, and kurios primarily of the son. Those are their Trinitarian names. In, in addition to that, we have explicit testimony in the Hebrew Scriptures where the son is called Elohim, the exalted Davidic king, the Messiah is called Elohim Kisach Elohim Lalam Ed in Psalm 45. Uh, that Elohim is seen in, in Exodus chapter 24, and that Brishit Bar Elohim in, in Genesis 1 1, that Elohim creates the universe. So Elohim refers to God, period, simple, we believe that. Elohim can also refer to the Son. Either they're two different gods or one true God that we worship. When you expand on that into New Testament testimony and find that in Acts 5, for example, lying to the Spirit is equivalent to lying to God, then the Spirit is also identified as God. So Father, Son, Spirit, all identified as God, that's triunity. It's also fascinating that in Semitic languages, to speak of power, to speak of majesty, you will, also, you will normally use a plural noun, frequently a plural noun. So we understand that Elohim, when referring to God, does not refer to God's plural. But in Semitic language, to refer to many power, you can refer in plural. Thank you. And 90 seconds for your rebuttal. Uh, yes, it seems to me extraordinary that one would not identify verse after verse after verse where God, Elohim, let's say Adonai, Kyrios, Theos, the various words for God, 11,000 of them altogether. Clearly, you'd expect, if you believe in a triune God, when you say Kyrios, when you say Adonai, when you say Theos, when you say Elohim, you mean the triune God. But in your book, uh, Dr. White, you mention this fact that God refers to the three, but you don't give us a text. You don't cite a text. An example. Now, I'm looking for it. Plain text. Where does Theos mean the triune God in the New Testament, let's say? Okay, your response, 90 seconds, I, Dr. White. Since the question was asked in my book, I, I, I've given many, many examples. The Father is identified as God, clearly. The Son is identified as God in numerous places. We didn't have any rebuttal to the text that we raised uh, at, at that point in Titus 2.13, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, other places like that. And the Spirit is the Spirit of God. If you're looking for a single text mm -hmm. where Theos is somehow meant to uh, apply to all three, mm -hmm. every single text in the Old Testament where no differentiation is being made between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would be that, and any reference in the New Testament to the generic actions of God in the Old Testament would likewise. It sounds like what's being said here, we don't want to see the clear distinction and the, and the revelation of the Father, Son, and Spirit in the New Testament, and we're going to reject the use of theos of these other two persons and say, give us a place where all three are identified by this one word that would require us to find a place where the, the word was not being clear enough to tell us who we were referring to, which post-incarnation and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit would be the exact opposite of what we would expect to find. I'd also point out that John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Either we have two gods there or one God who is both God and the word. I'd also point out that Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, that says in the beginning, God created universe that the, the New Testament tells us in passages I've cited before explicitly speak of the Father and Son creating together. Explicit, undeniable language. If you want to talk an abundance of scholarship, we can cite the abundance of scholarship, it, so there'll be a landslide. But, but it's clear. Thank you. It's clear. And a final response, 90 seconds. Uh, yes, we've got a lot of assumptions going here. In the beginning was the word, capital W. Where's that coming from? Let's look up the word word in the Old Testament, the Hebrew background of John, and find 1,200 examples where word is clearly in it. My word is not another person. So let's take the capital letter off word. Let's not translate all things are made through him, because the eight English translations before that time said all things are made through it. Let's not assume that it says in the beginning was the sun, especially when at Fuller Seminary, Colin Brown, my colleague, is saying it's patently wrong to read in the beginning was the sun. Patently wrong. It's the word, not the sun. The Son is what the Word became. The Word became the Son. Not one-to-one -one equivalent in, in John 1, 1. James Dunn, 2010. Lots of scholars to back us. Anything to add to that? Well, that's the end of part one. Uh, I, th I thought that was fascinating. I think our experts did an excellent job. And I think we should show our appreciation. Thank you so much. Dr. Buzzard, thank you so much. Uh, Gentlemen, we're now uh, going to enter into part two of the debate. Uh, this is going to be a 30-minute uh, section. It's going to be a free-form discussion of the two positions. So I'm going to ask a series of questions. 
alternating between both sides. And in this format, uh, we're going to take approximately four minutes uh, for a lively uh, discussion uh, from both sides. And uh, then we'll move on after four minutes to the next question. At three and a half minutes, you'll hear one thing. And uh, then at four, we'll hear the double bell and move on to the next question. Everybody ready? OK. Here's the first question. Uh, if the Jews of the first century didn't already believe that God existed in a triune form, isn't the Trinitarian view in conflict with Jewish thought? Dr. Brown, our Jew <laughs> Jewish member of the panel, let's start with you. You know, look, the fundamental thing that everyone here at this table agrees with is, is that the Messiah had to die and rise from the dead, and that was the one thing that the disciples missed, that they didn't understand, and that there's almost no evidence or no evidence that Jews at that time were expecting a suffering Messiah, certainly not a crucified Messiah, and yet that's the one thing that happened. So there's no question that there were blind spots. A and if we can agree that there was a blind spot on the most fundamental of all things, then the death of the Messiah, his disciples couldn't get it. After he rose from the dead, Luke 24, he had to open their minds to understand the scriptures. Mm -hmm. when, when in Matthew 16, Jesus says that he's going to go to the cross, Peter rebukes him. You'll never get to go to the cross. So mm -hmm. the fact that they may not have fully understood the complexity of God's nature, that doesn't surprise me at all. But what's interesting, though, is, is that you do have some things developing. Philo is an older contemporary of Jesus, and, and he talks about the logos a lot, the very word John uses for word in John 1.1. 1, 1. And he even speaks of the logos as a creative agent, even as a second God. It's very, very interesting. And the targums, which are the, the Jewish paraphrases, uh, they go back in some form even before the time of Jesus and then developed. They begin to talk about the memra of the Lord, the word of the Lord. And this memra even takes on a distinct identity. So what they're struggling with is, is how to identify, how to fully understand this God who is imminent and yet transcendent, who is visible and yet invisible. So, so Yeshua brings it to light, John 1.18. He makes him known, as James quoted earlier, he exegetes the Father. So number one, there, there were fundamental things that the Jewish people that they were getting wrong. Jesus explicitly addresses it on numerous occasions. And number two, there are streams of thought already, already developing in Jewish uh, tradition and in Jewish philosophy that fit very well in with the concept of God's triunity. How do you respond to that blind spots, Jewish blind spots? Well, I agree that there were blind spots. I mean, even today, we have many, many blind spots. We see through a glass darkly. However, uh, I believe that it can be firmly established that Jews of the first century did not believe in anything but the single God Hashem. I mean, that was it. They, didn't, they were not looking for, they did not believe uh, that there was a second God coming. When they we're saw not talking Yeshua, about a second God, though. We don't believe in a second God. We don't believe, we, we don't believe in that. All right. But, but right. quote me a text, Joe, just, just so I can understand. Quote me a Jewish text from the first century that is accepted by Jews as, as authoritative today, a, a, a Jewish text from the first century that talks about this issue. Well, uh, let me give you the Birkat Hamanim. Uh, Which dates from when, roughly? 90 Common Era. Oh, okay, so this is two generations after Jesus. That's right. At the earliest. That's right, but we're talking about the believers in Yeshua and what did they believe. Now, I submit that they did not believe that Yeshua was deity. They believed he was the Messiah. No, no, they no, saw, uh, well, my question, though, you said that Jews at that time were absolutely not believing in, expecting any, anything other than the, the, the Unitarian view of God, the way you're presenting it right. tonight. Okay, please just give me a first century text from a contemporary Jewish source that, that verifies that. But please, please quote them to me, because they're not, they don't exist. All the texts come from centuries later, so you are projecting later Jewish belief back into that time, whereas I have the witness of the New Testament, much of which is written by Jews, telling us explicitly what they believe, and, and we also have in John 5, that the, the, the Jews there are getting very upset with Jesus, and in John 8 getting very upset, and in John 10 getting very upset with him because of his explicit identification of himself with God. So he's making it clear that's a blind spot they may have had. He's making it clear, but you don't even have text to support the position you're, you're presenting. Well, uh, for one thing, we have Josephus, who goes into Jewish beliefs about God. He's, now, he's a generation after Jesus as well. Just give me one from that same time. That's all I'm asking. Uh, only, to, only to say the statement you're making well, doesn't have text behind it. That, that's, all, that's the only point I'm making. Uh, okay, in 30 Common Era, I mean, you didn't have even the New Testament. At the time that Yeshua was slain, Yeshua was resurrected, 
You didn't even have the New Testament. I mean, but we have the words of those witnesses, though, who, who were there. Whereas the Jew, any, any text accepted by Jews today as having authority comes from well after the time of Jesus. We'll stay on this for one more minute. This is uh, uh, a let very me go back interesting to the Berkat topic. Hamanim. Now, the Berkat Hamanim uh, is where uh, in the, the daily prayers, in the Shimon right, the, the 18 petitions, there was a benediction that was uh, put against and was applied to the believers. In all probability, there's there's debate about that. Or did there is it, debate did about it that. Say specifically the Jewish believers who are the minim, the heretics, or the. <laughs> but there's debate about that. Yeah, they're not. We know that they're not expelled from the Jewish community uh, until <coughs> after the Bar Kokhba revolt, uh, after 132 coming. I want to hear your point about this, because. Okay, in that all that time, uh, the Jewish believers are active in the Jewish uh, community, and uh, they're not expelled. Uh, but, but the, when the Birkat Hamanim comes forth, if it is applied to the believers, it is applied not because they believe uh, in, in an idolatrous way, that they believe that Yeshua is a deity, they would be expelled immediately well, okay. if that was believed. The, the first thing is they're already getting killed in the New Testament times. So how, how much do we have to go beyond that? They're, they're already being killed. John 16, Jesus tells them they're going to be put out of the, the synagogue, okay? Just confessing him as Messiah was enough to get them put out of the synagogue. So you're saying they weren't getting put out of the synagogue, even though the New Testament tells us they already were. Wait, 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 wait. A the and whole you're reason also that making the an Bar comes jo about in Nani Common Era is because there are so many Jews that believe that Yeshua is the Messiah in the synagogue. My point is, if they believed that he was deity, <laughs> they would have been put out immediately. No, no, yes, that's, that's by your interpretation of no, it. In other gonna... words, if you were the rabbi and you were interpreting it your way, you'd put them out. No, Maybe they... their views were more in harmony with the general understanding. Michael, than if you believe they accept. would not be put out of the Jewish community for believing that Yeshua was deity, I, I, I don't understand you at all. First thing, they were already being killed. Second thing, the New Testament explicitly says that there was reaction to Jesus when he identified himself as deity. They were ready to, to kill him. And on top of that, where do you, you have are that projecting... they were being killed by uh, by Jews? Oh, you know, I think of Saul. I think his name was Saul of Tarsus. Yes, but, uh, and, and I think that guy's attacked, name was okay? Stephen. Stephen he was comes attacked. to mind. I mean, he forgive me for being facetious, but. but it was okay. already happening. There was already, the, and then I, Saul has okay. this encounter, and what does he say? What do you okay. want me to do? Lord. Oh, okay, that I wasn't want, a man he was bound down to. I want to follow to. up on this with a question. Uh, when when uh, the Pharisees accused Yeshua of blasphemy, were, was it because they understood him to be declaring himself to be divine or deity? Is, is that deity your understanding? Is deity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so at all, no. Okay. He's claiming to be on a par with God, as an agent right. is with his sponsor. That's an enormous claim. But the worst they could say of Jesus at the trial was, you're claiming to be the Son of God. To be Son of God in the Bible, I'm quoting now Colin Brown at Fuller Seminary, to be Son of God in the Bible, I want this quite clear, means you're not God. Are we clear about that? The Son of God is an angel, it's the Messiah, it's not God. That should clarify the whole thing. And the worst they could say at the trial was, he's claiming to be the Son of God. He never goes around saying, I am God. He never says, no, at the trial, did they say you're making yourself to be God? Except at that same trial in John 19, yeah. when he calls himself the Son of God, what they say, we have a law, and yeah. by that law, he ought to die yeah. because he made himself out to be the Son of God. That's right. If that just means a representative God, there was no law against that. Exactly. The only law would be the law against blasphemy. When Jesus, Jesus does not say, I'm merely a representative, and uh, after that last long exchange, I was just going to compliment you on your tie, but uh, that's about all we, you and I could get into that last one, but, but there were two texts I wanted, wanted to try to introduce there, and I would like to hear the response. Jesus said to the Jews in John 8, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that ego I me, you will die in your sins. Yeah. And then in verse 28, so Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that oh. ego I me, and that I do nothing in my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Yeah. So at the end of this chapter, yeah. they pick up stones to stone him yeah. when he says, before Abraham was, yeah. ego I me. Yes. For those now who that, aren't yeah. theologians, I yeah. am. Just, I yeah. am, going back to Anahu oh. in, in Isaiah no. and the Minor Prophets. No. No. Uh, Jesus even used the very same phraseology of John 13, 19, where Yahweh is speaking of himself, of himself in John 13, 19, in the same context. 
Why the Jews pick up stones to stone him if all he was saying is, I'm just, uh, I'm just a representative? You're amazingly convinced by hostile Jews. Do you not know the Jews didn't understand what Jesus said most of the time? Why are you siding with them? Mm. He quickly says, in response to the accusation, you're making yourself to be God. He said, I am not. As the Son of God, I do what I'm told. That's John 5. I was talking about John 8, and in John 5, he doesn't say, I am not. He clarifies the relationship between himself and the Father, but he never says, he says he has, he can give life. The Father has given the right to give life and all the rest of these things. Yeah. Honor him, even as one of the Father. But John 8, yeah. you, you, say, you say you're siding with the hostile Jews. Mm. When Jesus does not correct what they're stating, but instead amplifies what they're stating mm -hmm. and keeps pressing the point so that they pick up stones to stone him, it does seem that their conclusions are just. A quick response and we're going to move on. Chapter, I threw chapter that in. 10, he says, haven't you heard that the judges are gods? If I call myself what? The son of God, to mean son of God means you're not God in the Bible, Colin Fuller, uh, uh, Colin Brown Fuller, that's quite clear. He's claiming to be the son of God. That's wonderful. But we just Gentlemen, jumped, we, but we just jumped from John 8 to John 10 yes. and missed, missed the actual meaning of John 10 of Jesus identifying them as false gods. And may I just say something? As a graduate of Fuller Theological yeah. Seminary, yeah. Um, what uh, the, the gentleman is talking about when he says, the Son of God, not God, is there is not, we are not saying that Jesus is the Father. There is a distinction. We oh, recognize yeah. the distinction. It yeah. is the Son who became flesh. It was yeah. not the Father who became yeah. flesh. Uh, that was something he voluntarily did. That means he had to have pre-existed to voluntarily do so. Okay, very quick, and I'm going to move on. Yes, uh, you made a, a point about Stephen. You made a point, point about Paul. Paul, first off, when they uh, attacked him in the temple uh, and they sought to kill him, uh, the issue was not <coughs> what he believed about Yeshua. When he addressed the crowd, everyone was quiet when he told them his beliefs in Yeshua until he got to the point about that the gospel had been offered to the Gentiles. So and you're saying the Jews point, had no problem with the fact that... No, no, no. Why I'm was saying he that so was upset the issue with or with Paul. That was the issue with Paul. Th there now, was an accusation that he had broken temple laws. That was, it, it, was a, it was a legal the, the, argument. And, but but here, here's the whole question, Joe. When, when, when Saul of Tarsus was so upset with his fellow Jews for belief, he was upset because they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And you are telling me that Jews would have no problem with that and that they wouldn't put people out of the synagogue oh, wait, wait, over wait. that. So you're missing a, wait, a fundamental I, 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 truth I'm here, not Joe. saying that many, many Jews of that period would have problems with Yeshua being the Messiah. What I'm saying is that when Paul was attacked, that wasn't the issue whether he was the Messiah or not. That dealt with the, the believing but, but no communities. Okay. That's, it's irrelevant, I'm going to move it along to the it's next irrelevant. point. Uh, we, we have limited time. We could go on with this for the rest of the time allotted. But I want to turn uh, our, our focus to John chapter 1. How do you understand John chapter 1? The Word became God. The Word was God. If I could just very briefly, uh, three clauses. In the beginning was the Word. Uh, the term that he uses for was is a timeless verb. It is in, in the imperfect. So as far back as you wish to push the, the beginning, the logos exists. The Logos is proston theon, face to face with theon, God, and the word was God. The position of the word theos in the sentence indicates that it is describing uh, the nature of the Logos. The Logos is as to his nature deity. Now, John is very careful in the prologue to never use the word agenita, the, the aorist form of genomai, of the Logos, which would point to a point of origin, a time of creation until John 1, 14, when the Word becomes flesh. So everything else, there's a man who came from God named John. That's, that uses a, a different verb. When you're talking about the Logos, the Logos does not have a point of origin in time. Then the Logos becomes flesh in John 1, 14 and dwells among us. We beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten the Father. And then you have that beautiful text, which is the, the bookends. It's the, it's the end of John 1, 1, John 1, 18, bookends of the, of the prologue of the Gospel of John. No one has ever seen God. The monogenes theos, a fascinating phrase, the unique God who is, in, who is at the Father's side, literally at the Father's bosom, the position of, of intimate fellowship. He has exegeted him. He has made him known. He has explained him. So 118 and 11 together explain to us what's being said. The Word is eternal. The Word has had eternal relationship with the Father. And the Word is as to His nature, deity. He is the one who has become flesh and has revealed to us the Father in a perfect way. You have a very different view of that. Okay. First of all, a huge assumptions being made here. In the beginning was the Logos. 1,200 occurrences of Logos in the Old Testament. 
Never a person. Not a spokesperson. God's word. Your word is not another son. It's not your son. Until it becomes the son. This is very easy. Wisdom is with God. We know that. This is very, he very Hebrew. The word was with God. And it, all things are made through it. If you had an English translation, all of the eight before the King James. It. So don't assume that that capital W is right. It's not a person. In the beginning was that utterance, that intention, that plan, that promise of God. It walked around as that marvelous Messiah, who is uniquely, uh, by the way, unique God. Much debate about whether that's even a genuine text. It's not the, it's more likely a. Hort says that's the highest form of derived being, monoyenes, theos possibly. Very doubtful text in 118. Don't rely on the doubtful text. Certainly not the unique God. That's wrong. Certainly not what the NIV has there. But start with wisdom and word, and please go back to Matthew. Please note the conversations all around the Gospel of John. Very suspicious. You know, the, the, the fact is, depending on what subject we're discussing, we look at certain texts. Yes. Uh, if we're talking about pastoral ministry, we look at Paul's pastoral letters. Of John emphasizes the deity of Yeshua, so of course we're talking a lot about that. It's, it's almost deceptive to say, look at the others, because the others don't contradict this in a single syllable. They reinforce it in many different ways. But, but let's look at this a little further. Uh, John 1.3 mm. says that everything was made through the Word. Yes. Well, 1 Corinthians 8.6 tells us that everything was made through Jesus. Colossians 1.16, everything was made through Jesus. Hebrews, the first chapter as well, everything was made through the Son. So it's telling us quite explicitly that this word is not an impersonal it. I don't worship an impersonal it. An impersonal it didn't die for me. An impersonal it does not make God known. This is a person, the Father creating all things through the Son. The New Testament witness is explicit. All you have to do, and sometimes it's the exact same words used in John 1, 3 and these other texts that I just mentioned, the exact same Greek that's used. So the New Testament is explicit. The Word is the Son. The Son is Jesus, who was eternally preexisted. I want Again, to ask a follow it's up. simple. I want to ask a follow-up question, because I'm not sure I'm understanding. Are you agreeing with... Uh, what I know the, Mor the, the Mormon translation says, for example, that the Word uh, was with God and the Word was a God. That's, no, no, that's, that's a Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness, excuse me. You're no, not, no, you're no, not no, saying no, I'm that. No, I'm simply saying that you are being misled by the capital W in your translations in the beginning was the Word. Take it down. Nothing in the Greek about a capital letter. Logos is not a person until it becomes a person at the begetting beginning of the Son. Go back to Matthew and Luke, find out when he began. We've, we've left all of that aside. So who is this? John. This but word is facing God, is, no. is with God. No, no. Pros, pros no. Why do you keep translating out to as it? Just, just because, just because oh. those, those other English translations before the King James, mm -hmm. which were primarily uh, Latin influenced, no, but, out, but as you know, out to is not a, is not, it, you can't prove that's a neuter. It can be mm -hmm. a masculine, right? It can be both. Right. Okay, it so, so why, but, 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 but the cool. point of the fact of the matter is, yeah. when you say, well, it's it, you are taking an assumption there. And I, I do need to, to correct something. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your statements about John 1.18, the vast majority of modern scholarship is on our side at this point mm -hmm. in regards to the meaning, meaning of monogenes theos and the occurrence of monogenes theos. P75, P66, mm -hmm. Alexander, mm -hmm. and Asaniad, they all read that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, not, to, 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 not with the article. Uh, not with the article. A, no, uh, a. You said the. But well, even, even with uh, a. However, whether the article is there or not mm -hmm. doesn't change the fact that Theos appears in all the most ancient mm -hmm. copies of the Gospel of John that we possess. And what's is a that uniquely true? begotten God? Yes, it's true. But, but what is it? A uniquely begotten God. Well, see, monogenes means unique, one of a kind. You exactly. keep emphasizing genao. Mm -hmm. Monogenes is not made of genao. Genao has two two news. Mm -hmm. Monogenes has one. It is genos. From kind or type. It means unique, not begotten. It's You're a, reading something in it that's not there. It's a sun word. It suggests a sun word. It doesn't, it's I'm certainly gonna, can be one I'm, I'm going to bring it down to, uh, <laughs> off the, the, the high theological level to yes. just straightforward. How can God have flesh and bones? Isn't that what Trinitarians teach? No, we're saying that God appears in human form. Colossians 2 9, the fullness of God dwells in bodily form. So Genesis, that's eight, Genesis 18. Uh, Yahweh appears in bodily form. A and that's, that's not a unique concept in the ancient Near East, by the way, for, for a, a God or the God to appear in bodily form. The Bible says that happened with Yahweh. Genesis 3 would point in the same direction, that, that Yahweh is actually walking with Adam and Eve in the, in the cool of the garden. So God can manifest himself in a thousand different ways. And he manifested himself in flesh and blood form while remaining God enthroned in heaven, while filling the universe by his spirit. So it, it, it's, 
we are not saying that God ceased to be God and came down off the throne and became a human being like, like Zeus or one of these other so-called exactly. gods. Exactly. We're, we are saying that he comes and dwells. It says in, in, in 114, John 114, he pitched his tent mm. among us. It's the exact equivalent of the tabernacle. Scholars have pointed out that he is like an earthly walking tabernacle. And, and, note, and notice Paul's words uh, when he says in Philippians chapter 2, describing the incarnation, uh, when, when the son did not, did not consider equality, which he had with God, something to be held on to, but he, and the term is literally emptied, but Paul never uses it literally. He always uses it met metaphorically. How did he do so? By doing two positive things, by taking the form of a servant being made in the likeness of men. So the making himself of no reputation was done by taking on that human form. So as I say to my, my Muslim friends when we do our debates, they, they, they're just scandalized by this concept. And I say, you need to understand something. You're starting with the assumption that the creator of mankind could never enter into his own creation for his own purposes. How could Allah, for them, create mankind, but then be, in essence, locked out of his own creation? If he has the power to create man, he can enter into man, as the Word of God clearly says he did. I agree with that. Yes, of course. We do. Uh, I have a question that kind of stems from this. Uh, in Yeshua's resurrection, uh, my question is, he's resurrected back to the fullness of God? What do you mean back to the fullness of God? Well, I mean... He remains the God-man. Uh, okay. He doesn't it, cease being the God-man. And, and he is, for the purposes of redemption, subservient to the Father's purposes. His purpose is to honor the Father. The Holy Spirit's purpose is to draw attention to Jesus. Whatever is so done... So he's not equal to the Father? He's equal in what way? You mean in, in participation in the divine being or in the, in the position that each of the divine persons has taken in the redemption of mankind? Well, uh, what I'm talking about in 1 Corinthians 15, it has that he is, he is under the Father uh, uh, when all things are put under his feet. He's still under the Father. That God may so be all in all. That a, God may be all in all. We right. have a greater God than we have a lesser God. Where does that put the no, we Holy have, Spirit? we have one God. See, that's where you guys keep coming up with multiple gods. We're worshiping one that's God. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> because you're hearing it through either one through ear, as James ears, said, yeah. through one eye closed. Right. We mm -hmm. keep talking about one God, yes. Father, Son, Spirit, but one God. I am one human being, yes. body, soul, spirit. Yes. Do, do you believe that Yahweh's essence is limited in time and space? Absolutely not. So why can't that unlimited essence be shared by three divine persons? Well, because be. you're assuming, be. because yes. your, your assumption be. and, and all yeah. of your interpretation is <clears throat> that's not possible. No, my assumption is that since you describe God as a one what, let me, let me give your description of God. He's three who's, I want you to be clear about this, in his very interesting book on the Trinity. Three who's in one what? Mm -hmm. I do not find the, the singular masculine pronoun, he, to describe a what. Let's talk about an it. Let's be fair. Let's talk English. Let's speak the language. If he's going to be one what, then he's not a he. You're giving me he, but and you're asking me to believe he's three. Anthony, he Anthony, three. You're, you're not allowing even me to define my own, own language. I am talking about the being of God, and I am talking about the persons that share that yes. one being. That being is personal, but not a person. You're, you're turning that into a, in some type of yes. impersonal thing, like an object, a, a rock, or, you're calling or, or it a something like you're that. You're calling it a what? To, to, to make the distinction between yes. the persons and the one being, that one name Yahweh describing each of the yes. three persons, that one being that is unlimited that they share fully. One what, you say? Uh, well, well, the being one what? The being, being of God. God is can one what? Can, 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 can I just ask a clarification yeah. question? Uh, you want to bring things back into English. Yeah. Uh, I'd rather keep them in, in Hebrew and Greek, which you're very happy with yeah. ultimately. Yeah. So in, in Hebrew, mm. uh, what would be the word for he versus what would be the word for it? No difference, probably. It. Who? In masculine. That's right. But it's a singular personal pronoun. And one God is one Father in Malachi. It's very clear. Have we not all no, one but, God? But, but my question, Have we not one you, Father? You just made a big point about the difference yeah. between he and it in English. Yes. But uh, whether it's in Greek yes. or in Hebrew, yes. it could be the same term used yeah, for but both. But the Father is not an it. Well, we agree it's not an it. But He's you, made, you said the word was an it. You said the word was an it. Yes. And an it is, is the thing that came into this earth. We said, no, the word is a person, a son. But Logos yeah. is an it until otherwise. Okay, we're going we're gonna <laughs> to move on. I, I think we'll all agree this is a highly complex uh, topic. We're gonna, we're gonna, we have a question on Matthew uh, 3, mm. 16 and 17. Uh, one of the uh, more well-known examples of the existence of three persons uh, is the uh, baptism of Yeshua recorded in Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. Here the Father speaks from heaven. The Son is being baptized and is again described as being the object of the Father's love, and the Spirit is descending as a dove. How is this not a clear identification 
of the triunity of God. We all believe in the Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father. The issue between us is, are they all the one God? Of course I believe in the Son of God. I don't think he's God, because he began in the womb of Mary. That's quite clear. You can't be God. You cannot die, by the way, if you're God. That's quite clear. The immortal God cannot die. By definition, Jesus could not be God. He died. God doesn't die. So that's entirely clear to me. The idea that he is God is simply contradictory to every possible idea about immortality. That's clear. Did, did his spirit die? In, in your view, the did the Son did, of God died, Paul said. Did, did the spirit die? Did the spirit depends how you define the spirit. Yeah, yeah. Did, did the spirit of, immediately the go into the, uh, uh, the spirit You believe the that Jesus had a spirit? Everybody has a spirit. Okay, did the spirit die? Uh, Does the anybody Son of God die? Died. Oh, so, so your whole argument then re really no, goes the nowhere. The Son of God that. died, and that's but, supposed to be God uh, the right. Son in your language. So, right. the, so the, God the Son of God, as a human being, died. But, as a human being, you said. But this his is, spirit. This, spirit. <laughs> this is amazing to me because this is the exact <laughs> argument that my Muslim friends make, and they, they say, God cannot die. And I, I take them to John chapter 10. What did Jesus say? No one takes my life from me. I give it of my own accord. Yeah. Jesus voluntarily gives his life, but he doesn't cease to exist. He says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Yeah. So I'm, well, I, people question. say, yeah, well, well who was running, who was, who was running <laughs> uh, the universe when, when Jesus was dead? And I'm like, he didn't cease to exist. He gave his life as a sacrifice. And that's the same thing here. You said by definition, yes. Jesus cannot be God. So what you're saying is by definition, God could not enter into his own creation so as to give his life as a ransom for his people. That's by definition. That's assuming the end of this argument rather than allowing the word of God to define the parameters yeah, of the I argument itself. I disagree with so much of that. It would take a while to unpack it. I don't think you're alive when you're dead. That's a different point of view. <laughs> no argument on that point. So, you know, so, no, and so Moses and Elijah are really dead, but they appear on the Mount no, of course. Transfiguration. No, no, well, they can work that out easy. Hebrews 11 says they all died. That's quite clear, including them. Everybody died. But all they didn't cease people. to exist. They died. But they didn't Lazarus cease to exist. Is di is dead he's not the God of the dead. He's not the God of the of dead, but of the living, because, because all be live to him. Exactly. But when the Son of God dies, he doesn't live. No, no. I have a problem. Yeah, but with you misunderstood. But, 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 let's, that let's get back. You misunderstood. Let, let's get back to the, <laughs> let's get back to the beginning issue. It's, it's spirited. You, you keep coming back to that. The, the beginning language occurs yes. most clearly in Psalm two, which is a coronation psalm. It doesn't speak of the creation of the king. It, it, it speaks of when the king is coronated. Who that those Psalm Psalm yeah. two, mm -hmm. because this is the mm -hmm. decree the Lord said to yes. me, "You are my son." Speaking yes. first and yeah. foremost to the Davidic king, and then by application to the Messiah. Uh, okay. Psalm two, rightly mm -hmm. understood, historically understood, mm -hmm. as the vast majority of scholars, since mm -hmm. you like to mm -hmm. cite scholars, mm -hmm. would agree. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. this day I begotten you, does yes. not speak of bringing him into existence, did, but of his taking on the role of son, right. just as in Second Samuel, the seventh chapter, God says to oh. the descendants of David, I'll be a father to them, they'll be my sons. Right. So at the time of coronation, they were recognized Ooh. as that role of son of God. So as Jesus comes into the world, he is now designated son of God. Cool. At his resurrection, Romans 1, Acts 13, he is recognized Disagree. as son of God. Hey, jump so, in here. And the son, <laughs> the other thing, just to remind yeah. those tuning in, and maybe that missed the other point, all the references we gave to the pre-existence of the son, mm. they haven't been shot down, haven't been touched. The explicit references, like Isaiah 6, like Genesis 18, like these other passages, the other verses that we quoted that speak of the preexistence of the Son, tell us now that he was not created uh, at, 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 at when he entered Miriam's womb, but now he takes on the role of Son of God as he comes into the earth in that form that his resurrection declared the Son of when God with power. When he entered Mary's womb, did you hear it? When he entered from outside, is that what Luke and Matthew describe? I beg you to go back and read the synoptics and see if there's anything about anybody entering. No, no, that which is begotten her in her. Matthew 1.20, I want you to read the Greek carefully. Not conceived only, it's the same thing, but begotten. That which is fathered, brought into existence in her, is the Son of God. It's the human being. And the, the Son, son was eternally preexistent. We've seen all the texts That's that say it. So, it. so I read, no, what I do is I don't start reading in Matthew. I start reading in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures. By the time I get to Matthew, I already see the preexistent Son. So it's, again, it's very clear. And John 1 makes it abundantly clear for anyone that might have missed it. Okay, here's, my, here, here's my favorite question uh, of part two. We understand on the cross, Jesus was separated from God. How is this possible if he is himself God? How can uh, one God be divided? I, I don't remember anything in the Bible about Jesus being separated from God. Uh, when Jesus cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, uh, that is from Psalm 2, and uh, so 22. And when you read the 22nd Psalm, 
what do you discover there? You discover it is a deeply messianic psalm, and how does it end? It ends with the vindication of the suffering servant. And so, uh, unlike many strong sermons I've heard, uh, the fact of the matter is that on the cross, when Jesus does that, everybody knows the Psalter was the hymn book of the Jewish people. And you didn't have to sing the whole psalm uh, to remind people of what it was about. If I said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, I don't have to finish it for everybody in this audience because they already know what the rest of it is. In the same way, when Jesus says this, the very next words from his lips are, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So the Father is still there. That's in the second person. Uh, this idea that when Jesus is offering the greatest uh, obedience to the Father, when he's doing exactly what the Father has sent him to do, he's drinking the cup, that somehow there is a, a fundamental disturbance of the Godhead and a, and, a, and a separation of the Father and the Son, I have absolutely no reason to believe that. I, if, if there was something like that, the book of Hebrews would have picked up on it. It's not there. Uh, I, I think it's just a fundamental misreading of the quotation. So you don't understand Psalm 22. the sacrifice to be to, to, that Yeshua, when he bore the sins of the world, that he experienced a separation from the Father. He experiences the wrath of God. That's a vast difference from a, an actual, the, the question is asking, in essence, was there a fundamental uh, separation of two divine persons from one another? And I, that would create ditheism. That would create a, a separation of Godhead. It would just be absolutely impossible. I think that's a misreading of Psalm 22. Yeah, and the Psalm 22 point is quite clear. The, the forsakenness is, is that I haven't been delivered from, from this deathly situation, but then he is delivered to the praise of the entire earth. So by quoting that, he's drawing attention to Psalm 22. If, if there was any type of a spiritual separation that you just wanted to, to talk about symbolically because of him taking the sins of the world on his shoulders and feeling the weight of that, that's not an issue. But a separation between father and son in terms of a reality of separation is another story. Now, that's your question, so do you want to comment on that? that? Do you believe there was a separation on the cross? Uh, I can agree with what they said, that there was, that uh, on the forsaken thing, I don't have a problem with that. Um, what I, I do have, a, I do have a major problem with the idea of Yeshua being deity and being killed. Now, I want to separate between being dead, eternally dead, like the, the soul being dead, mm -hmm. and being killed, because I don't believe God can be killed. Uh, the, uh, I, I don't believe that God can be uh, limited. Uh, you asked me uh, a, a moment ago about can he, be, can he be limited in any way. I don't believe God can be limited in his knowledge, in his understanding, in all things. I do think he can be limited by his own word. In other words, uh, it says God cannot be a man, and uh, or God is not a man. Yeah, it's a different statement. Yeah, it is a different statement, but it, it definitely says God is not a man. Uh, we have. Uh, Do you think we believe that he is in his nature? I think that you believe that when Yeshua came, that he was God. Yes, but you, you, you see okay. the difference but between saying that the essential man, nature of God. God. He, he pitched his tent among us. Numbers 23, 19, God is see, not a man I, that he I should lie. I have no Another, problem with him pitching his tent among us, but I don't see that as a reference to him being deity. But, but if he pitched his tent, who lived in the tent? His agent. His agent lived in the tent. That's right. He no, represented no, him. He, he represented him. The fullness him. of God <laughs> dwelt in him in bodily who, form. And, and let's also remember that the who apostles and all these others were... redeemed the people out of Egypt? The apostles and all these others were called agents, but nobody worshipped them, and the worship due to Jesus couldn't go to them. Who, who, who redeemed the people out of Egypt? God. That's right. Okay. Who was his agent? Moses. Okay, and that's the first redemption. You but have the but first they did redemption, not worship the Moses. Second, they, absolutely, you don't worship they, them. But they worshipped the Son. And, and God did not pitch his tent in Moses. He pitched his tent in a tabernacle, and his glory, his see, glory dwelt I, there. So, so let, let's just look at the analogy. Think for a second. God pitched his tent. Exodus 25. Make for me a holy place, and I will dwell in their midst. God dwells in the tabernacle. Who dwelt in the physical tabernacle of the body of Jesus? God. Okay, God incarnate. That it's on. the only possible way to read it. Uh, uh, I'm going to go to the worship, okay? Uh, you say, well, well, they worshipped him. You're, uh, Revelation, Revelation five. four, five. Uh, Revelation yeah, five, five. Uh, and I'm sure you could go to Daniel in chapter seven, uh, where the Son of Man came and demeaned, raised, and honored, and all of this. Yeah. Uh, 
but I see this exactly as what we saw back in Chronicles. Uh, and I see it as a homage to, uh, which is exactly the same word, uh, a homage that is given to the king. And the king sits on the throne of God. And that's, uh, we have... Uh, we have a precedent that suck in the Tanakh. We see the same thing followed out, and now we want to change what it means. Yeah, no, we just, want to change the direction. Just to get I'm, I'm going to jump in with another question because okay. you talked about the throne of God. I would really like to talk about Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at your, my right hand until I make These two have been priming for this for a while. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about that one. I love that text. Right, Psalm 101 is quoted more often than any other verse from the old. Very important, right? Do not go away without... Pondering Psalm 101. Jesus used that to silence all questions. 110. 110. 110. 110. 110 verse 1. Jesus used that to silence all objections. Marvelous. Jesus has just discussed the Shema. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. One Lord, I repeat, one Lord. One single Lord. Kyrios East, that's clear. Echad, one single. One Lord. Then he discusses, well, who is Jesus then? Certainly not that one Lord. He's now going to talk about two lords in Psalm 101. I want you to be very careful looking at the Hebrew here. It says that Yahweh, 7,000 times the name of God, Adonai, the personal name of God. Yahweh, by oracle, speaks to Adonai. Adonai, I want you to look it up very carefully. Go to the rabbi. If you can't read the Hebrew, read it. Because it's been misreported in some of your commentaries as being Adonai, even in the margin, may I say, of the New American Standard updated version. It's not Adonai. It's not Yahweh speaking to Adonai. There'd be God talking to God. The universe would collapse. It's Yahweh speaking to Adonai. Check Adonai 195 times. It always is a non-deity title. Yes, it's only a difference of pointing. But it's so important that Jesus used this psalm to settle all issues. God speaks to non-deity. That's There's one God and one Lord, Jesus, Messiah, the man Messiah Jesus. That's exactly what Paul said in 1 Timothy 2.5. One God, one exalted Adonai. That's what Sarah calls Abraham, Adonai. That's what uh, Abigail calls David. Got it? That's the non-deity title, Adonai, Adonai, Adonai. You know Adonai, it rhymes with El Shaddai, El Shaddai, you know it, Adonai. That's not the word there. It is not, not, not the word, although you will find it misreported, amazing, in many commentaries who cannot apparently read the Hebrew. Please check Psalm 101. Vow to yourself to check that out and resolve what it says. James, you have a different... Uh reading of that. Or the people translating the New American Standard actually read the Hebrew as it appears in the Qumran scrolls that existed at that time. <coughs> and we recognize that the vowel pointing came hundreds of years later. I have here uh, a section from the Isaiah scroll that has the word Adonai Turn in it. it this way. I want to see. Uh, there's, there, you can see the, the Hebrew right here. Yeah, sorry. I'll show it this way too. There we go. Ah, uh, there we go. All right. Uh, <laughs> Do I get a kickback from Apple for this? Uh, what, what is it? Um, but um, uh, this has no vowel pointing. This would have been the Hebrew of the day when the New Testament was written. The difference between Adonai and Adonai was added hundreds of years after the New Testament was written. There is no distinction whatsoever. I can show it to you. If you can, if I can show you where Adonai is. It's right there. You cannot tell the difference between Adonai and Adonai as the Hebrew is written at that time. Now, Sir Anthony has said that this particular text should be the governing text for reading the entirety of the New Testament. You said that in your debate with Fred Sanders. Uh, the problem with that is there is nothing in the original text that differentiates between these two terms. The Greek Septuagint does not differentiate between these two terms. When you and I dialogued on a radio program in London just a few months ago, you said the Septuagint differentiated between the two. The reality is that the very same Greek language that translates Adonai is translates Adonai in Psalm 35.23 and Psalm 16.2. And so both of those texts indicate there is no differentiation whatsoever. Therefore, when this comes into the New Testament from the Greek Septuagint, there is none of the distinction that you have so strongly emphasized, as far as I can tell, in Just every single Just to make it clear, you're talking talk. 250 B.C. When you talk about the Septuagint, Septuagint roughly. Septuagint, 250, 200 just, years before Christ. No differentiation found there. Nothing in the original that differentiates between the two. It is, all you're telling me when you're telling me that the Masoretes pointed this differently is that five to 900 years after Jesus, they rejected the deity of Christ. That's not a news flash. We know that at that time that wait, they wait, did. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, where did you get five that. to 600 years later they reject the deity no, the of Masoretes. the Masoretes? All he's saying is that that reflects. The Masoretes. Right. 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 The pointing, as mm -hmm. we can see right here, demonstrates that okay. that was not a part of the text. Let, let the me time. mention something on the Isaiah scroll. Now, you've mentioned several times Isaiah chapter <clears> 6, <throat> which, by the way, I believe is a vision, uh, but 
uh, not to go into that right now, but in the Kedusha, the, you have Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. In that scroll, it only has two, Holy, Holy. Now, this has been the basis for, uh, all I'm saying is, I find the text questionable. I, I, there's errors that are in that text. But that has absolutely nothing to do with what I was saying. No one argues. Are you arguing uh, no, no, that no, there was I'm a not. differentiation? I'm just saying, I'm just saying that I have, I have a problem with this particular text. That's all I'm saying. All right, using the Isaiah scroll. But, okay, so let, let's just look at a, a couple other issues, though. Isaiah 6, who did he see? Adonai, sitting on the throne. Okay, that, that's what it first says. Then he's identified as Yahweh. Yeah. John 12 tells us yeah. that was Jesus yeah, that he pictures. saw. All right, two right, so so that's, that's the first thing, that it was Jesus that he saw, and yet he uses Adonai there. The, the second thing is, is that the whole argument you're using, with all, with all respect to what you're saying, uh, even aside from what, what James has pointed out, the whole argument ha has no significance anyway. If, if it's written by a court poet, okay, it, it is a court poet speaking about David. If it is written by David, as the New Testament uh, affirms, it is David speaking about his master, Messiah. the Messiah. Mm. That's the only point being made there. He doesn't have to be arguing for deity there. Which he's you simply, both agree about. He's simply referring to his master, the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus is saying, yeah. he's trying to say, explain uh, uh, the opposite point of what you're making, that he can't only be the son of David. If he is a created being that is a physical right. descendant of David, then yeah. he's not greater than David. His whole point oh, no. is that he's greater than David, which is why David calls him master. He's greater because he's the preexistent one. No, no, but no, I must no. find out from Sir Anthony. Yes. Sir Anthony. Yes, of course. In the Septuagint, yes. at Psalm, it's 3423 yes. mm -hmm. there. kai mm hakuriasmu. -hmm. Does that sound familiar to you? Of course. Where of course. do we find that in the New Testament? You've got a couple of examples. I've got 449 occurrences of Adonai, which always in the Masoretic pointing. And I, I hear you are saying, I, I hear this, you say. This is after the New Testament. Yeah, but are you saying the Hebrew text is wrong here? I'm saying the, the vowel pointing is a commentary. But you're saying it's wrong. It's, it's, I'm saying it's a commentary yes. that reflects the viewpoints of the people who made and it. it's wrong. I just showed you the Isaiah scroll that does not contain it. It is a later commentary. Wrong, right isn't the issue. Does it represent what would have been taught by Jesus at that time? That's what we should be concerned about. Yes, and I'm very concerned with that. Because in the argument in the New Testament is that Jesus is superior to the angels. If he's God, you don't need to say that. They argue in the Hebrews on the basis that Adoni is the word there, clearly. They're saying, this is better than the angels. That's silly. If the word is Adonai... So, if it were. Okay, we just moved to Adonai. Hebrews 1, didn't we? Yes, no, the whole New Where he's explicitly called God and the one who created everything and in the beginning. And he identifies Yahweh. <laughs> but, but, my, but, my point is, but my point is, there is no yeah. differentiation in right. the Greek Septuagint, is there? In? In the Greek Septuagint, yeah, yeah. there is no way of knowing oh, yes, of it whether it was Adonai or Adonai, is there? No, there absolutely okay. is. You've got 449 right. examples Wait, of There absolutely Adonai. is or absolutely isn't? There absolutely is. How? How you've do you got, tell you've that? Got a couple of exceptions which are which for linguistic reasons occur. The two that you quoted. I've got I've got 195 occurrences of Adonai, distinguished from Adonai 449 times. But, but, but how do if, if that's if, what the rabbis the, have the done? Not in the Greek Septuagint. But, yes, Kyrios Mu. Look at Ladoni. You won't find you won't find Ladoni as Kyrios Mu, uh, other than Kyrios Mu. It's getting technical. Okay. You won't find Ladoni other than Kyrios Mu anyway. In some, though, the whole point yeah. you're making yeah. proves nothing because David was simply speaking about the Messiah as his master. Yes. He didn't have to confess him as God everywhere. Not every confession. He never did. Never imagined the Messiah was an anointed one was God. The, 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 fact, the fact is, <laughs> all the texts mm. that we present, just to emphasize again, mm. that pointed to preexistence, not one has been shot down or even really touched. We haven't had time. Touched. We haven't had okay, time. Yeah, at the same problem. time we've had. Well, we don't have time to continue with this que question. We have to move on to the next one. In John 5, 19 through 24, mm. Jesus clearly differentiates himself from the Father, yet claims attributes that are only proper of deity life, judgment, and honor. In John 5.30, the son says he can do nothing of himself, yet in verses 37 through 39, he identifies himself as the one witnessed to by the scriptures who can give eternal life. Can any being do this other than Yahweh, yod of the Tanakh? That's the issue. That's, That's the exact the issue. You want to do that one? Well, to begin with, it states that, that Hashem gave him that power. Yes. Okay? So, it's, a, uh, it's an automatic thing. He had the power that was given to him from above. It's not something that he had uh, of his own. Uh, the words that he spoke, these were the words that 
uh, were given to him to speak. And uh, the actions that he did, these were the actions that were, he was empowered to do. In each one of these, over and over and over, he makes the statement, especially in John chapter 6, John chapter 7, I'm the sent one, I'm the sent one, I'm the sent one from heaven. To reject me is to reject the one sent from heaven. The word there, of course, in Hebrew is the shliach. The, he's the agent. He says over and over, that's who I am. Now, the agent isn't understood. As far as I know, at any point, he, we find the shliach all through the Tanakh. And one of your main places is uh, the case of Moses in Exodus chapter 3, where he's the agent of the first redemption. How, how would you say apostolos in Greek? I, I don't Apostolos is apostle. Is uh, excuse word. me. How yes. would you say apostolos in Hebrew? Shaliach. 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 Mm. Ah, yes. Okay, so, so your whole point mm. about Jesus being this unique Shaliach, mm. the word for apostle in the New Testament yes. would be the equivalent right. of Shaliach. Yeah. That's People right. don't worship the Shaliach. People don't bow down I don't to the believe Shaliach that they and call worship, the Shaliach Lord. They worship Jesus either. Of course okay. they here, here. Not with Latrevo, not with religious worship. We haven't Daniel done Daniel 7, they did. The servants of the Son of Man in annual service receive the truth. That's, that's the term in Septuagint. Also the son, of, the son of Man corporate, the saints, the same thing. Same word. The, no, no. At saints the end of that chapter, the, wor the worship is to the individual at the end that's of Daniel right. 7. So you believe that the text says you believe that the So then you're saying that worship people him. worship a we group? We do not believe that. People worship... Oh, okay. So hang on. You quoted John 5, <laughs> all right? That I everyone should John honor, yes, Anthony did. did. Everyone yeah. should honor the no, son yeah. the way yes. they honor the father. Of course. Do you honor the son exactly the way you honor the father? Could you get down on your knees right now and as, this, as everything created does in the book of Revelation and say praise and honor and glory belong to, to you, O oh God, and to you, Lord Jesus. Mm. Could you do that, Joe? In that and, and do you do in that? In that context, <laughs> in that context, the way you stated it right there, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Do you do that? Do I do that? Is that in your hymnology? Is that you, you spend time worshiping mm -hmm. Yeshua in those? Well, you spend time praise, honor, glory. You pray to Him the way Stephen did. Well, you, you let, me, let me let me ask you something. You pray the Lainu? No, I, I don't follow Jewish tradition. That's okay. later. Okay. Uh, well, Although I, pray I respect the Lainu, it, I don't the Lainu has exactly that text. Now, whenever I go through that text, whenever I go through that prayer, what do I have in my mind? I don't know. I have, I, in my mind, I have exactly what we read in Philippians, okay? That every knee will bow to him. All right, so how, how about if we just Yeshua, do this exercise here? I see here. Yeshua as the Lord of Lords, as the King of Kings, that he has been put there. Now, don't uh, make God can, of gods can, can we do, I say can, Lord of can, Lords. Can we I mean, do this master together? Of can we worship him as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, and say to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, can you join me in doing this now? Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever to you, Lord Yeshua, and to you, O Father. You can join with me in doing that without compromise, without hesitation. I can, I can do that. I can do that. But it is with my understanding that Hashem has, made, has elevated him to that position. I will not give that glory to a human being. God forbid that I give that glory, that praise, that honor to a human being. And sirs, you should not do it. That is defiling, that is wrong in the sight of God. That glory, worship, and honor only belongs to a divine being. Yeah. When you worship God and the Lamb side by side as one, and when Revelation 22 tells us mm -hmm. that his servants forever will serve him, the one God, God and the Lamb, that, that tells no, me that we God don't, wanna, God there, not, we not don't there. want to mess yeah. with those truths. Yeah. And you do yeah. not want to give that kind of glory and praise to a created fleshly being. But it's Michael, a serious error. Us the word, talk about the word latrevo. There's a word for religious worship in Greek, not the general word proskineo is to worship. You can worship human beings in the Bible. You can. Proskineo. We gave we you Daniel that. 7. Yeah, Daniel 7 explicitly says Son it. Of man There's and your the saints. answer. The saints are also worshipped. Same word. No, no, the best, the best reading of that is recently demonstrated in a, in a good article on it. The Aramaic is referring back to the hymn, namely the Son. Uh, otherwise, your whole point defeats itself that religious worship can be given to a group of people. Therefore, the word itself proves nothing. Or it shows that worship belongs to God and the Son is also God. You haven't God. Told La Trevor, though. You haven't told me what <laughs> we, we've, we've said it. We just, we've we said just, it repeatedly. Wait, Daniel said it. But, but, but since the question asked us very, very quickly, yeah. I want, I want to, we, we jumped away from John 5, mm. unfortunately. But please, make sure people understand. The, the, the interpretation I heard of John 5 was exactly what I hear from my Muslim friends. Mm -hmm. It misses the context. Jesus <coughs> said to the Jews, mm -hmm. my father is working until now and I am working. Mm. What about those words caused the Jews such anger? 
because they recognized Jesus was asking, was, was claiming the same prerogative that God himself has to keep the universe functioning on the Sabbath day itself. And notice, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The interpretation given was, well, the Jews were all wrong, and Jesus goes on to correct that. That is not what John chapter 5 is about. John chapter 5 is a demonstration of the absolute unity of the Father and the Son. The Son is not some separate renegade deity out there doing his own thing. And when he says the Son does nothing, off hey out to, from himself, that does not mean that he is not deity. What that means is he has perfect unity with the Father, and he has been sent by the Father to accomplish a specific task. And thank God he accomplishes that perfectly. Okay, to, you to, want to quickly respond? I have three questions, and yeah. I want to ask Stone. We're really running out of and time. As in this God, section. I do what I'm told, he said. As God, according to your reading, I do what I'm told. What sort of a God is this? Well, that, because, sir, think about what you just said. You are giving me the only other possibility is to have two gods that fight with each other instead of a son who is d doing exactly what glorifies the Father and what he was sent to accomplish. You don't even allow for the possibility of the reading that we ourselves have established from many other sources. And that he, t he took on human form. He humbles himself so he is functioning in a certain way and is designated in a certain role here. That's what but Philippians 2 says. He stripped these things off. If he didn't previously exist, why did he have to strip off all these divine oh, prerogatives? But to both of you, either. I'm hearing a, a, a subordinate... Uh, as Trinitarians, I'm still hearing you say both a number of times that Yeshua is still subordinate to the Father. This is, this is the eternal covenant of redemption. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit take different roles in redemption. It's not the Father who became flesh. It's not the Spirit who became flesh. Each takes the role that they take freely in the self-glorification of the triune majesty and the redemption of God's people. So, so the Son voluntarily, that's, that's why it's so beautiful to see the, this repeated over and over again. Who who emptied himself? He emptied himself. He gives himself. These are all voluntary actions on the part of the Son. Of he does these things voluntarily. And so he has taken that role. That's a different role than the Father. He subjects himself. That's why in John 14, 28, he says to the disciples, if you'd loved me, you would have rejoiced when I said I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I am. He's walking the dusty roads of Galilee. He's constantly under the attack of the Jews who were trying to trip him up. And if they were thinking of something other than themselves, they would have rejoiced when Jesus says, I'm going back in the very presence of the Father. They would have rejoiced at that. And you see that as an argument that he's not, in fact, deity. I that just don't, I don't to the accept Father. the it's assumptions here in Philippians 2. I want you to read Kuschel. I want you to read Ulrich. I want you to study German. Uh, if you can't, read the scholars. We haven't got nearly a broad enough vision here. We're hearing a rather limited vision. Read Philippians 2 in some of these modern scholars. Please do it. Kuschel, born before all time, question mark. The arguments about the deity of Jesus and his preexistence. A fine book. You know, Read it. John, you know, we're, we're assuming, this, I, we're assuming I, I, I'm going to get this question in. God. I'm going to get this question in. Yeshua serves as the one mediator between man and God. Scriptures define that the mediator is a man. Wouldn't this disqualify Yeshua as the mediator yeah. if he is God himself? Of course. Yeah, I, I, actually, it's, it's the opposite. What God was, the Word was, I this is the Word that, 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 that becomes no. flesh. <laughs> and he's fully man. So there's right one there. God. And one mediator between God and man, the man, Messiah, Jesus. Ah. In fact, that's why it explicitly has to call him the man, Messiah, Jesus, because he is not only man. It speaks of him as a man in Acts, uh, the second chapter, that God accredited him, ah. the man, with uh, signs, wonders, and miracles. In Acts 2.36, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So he takes on a certain role, hmm. and he lives out that particular role. There's no argument there, but if he's merely a man, if he doesn't carry divine nature, if he's not the fullness of the God, Godhead in bodily form, he can't redeem us. E even if he's a perfect man, he does not have the power to redeem us because God alone is the Savior and God alone is the Redeemer. And that's a universal testimony. So God comes into our midst so as to save us in the person of his Son, thereby joining himself with humanity Respond in Jesus. Respond to that. How can he atone for our sins if he is not, in fact, God? rather than just atoning for his own sins. If he's just man, how can he atone for his sins? As he sends forth his son as an agent, he empowers him to represent him, to act for him. He, uh, he becomes, according, according to the law of agency, the agent becomes the one that has sent him. And that's, that's exactly the way it reads. And that's what you're, you're substituting every place that it has that 
with well, I'm uh, not he's, substituting. Look, he's I, I know the saying, you know, that, that this, this sh, the the Adon is like the shaliach. I mean, the well-known Talmudic saying. No one's arguing that. But but your application of it is a hundred percent contrary to the one it's, the way it's used. For example, That's if right. I send you as my representative, okay, mm -hmm. to collect a debt then you carry my authority, just like an ambassador, all right? Mm -hmm. However, like I said earlier, you cannot come and, and, and be the grandfather of my grandchildren or the father of my children or the, or, or the, 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 the husband of my wife because you are not me. And, and nor are you identified as me. You are simply representing me. So everyone understands what the text means. But, but the, the, when, when you have the worship to God and the Lamb, all praise, honor, and glory, when you have every tongue bowing down and calling him Lord, and the text explicitly speaks of Yahweh, when you have it said explicitly that he is the one that was seen, Yahweh was seen, it was Jesus, that's, that's not the agent, Joe. I mean, we, you can keep throwing it out and quoting it ad infinitum. I, I know what the concept means, but as it, it, it utterly falls short of what's said about Jesus in the New Testament, that he's called Elohim in Psalm 45, that he's called El Yibor in Isaiah 9, 6, and in these various other passages. I mean, it's, it's, it's straightforward. Let's come back to he tabernacles among, he pitches his tent. God dwells in the midst of a fleshly body. Not the agent dwells, but God dwells in a fleshly body. The New Testament makes that as, as plainly as it can be said, it's said. A uh, question for you. Uh, throughout the Tanakh, we read of the angel of the Lord in uh, performing all types of various things, giving all types of messages, appearing to different individuals and so forth. Are you saying that each of these, each time, that this is going to be a be Yeshua and a pre-existence? I haven't cited one of those. I, uh, uh, I'm asking. I it's possible that in certain, because angel, malach in Hebrew, mm. Angelos in Greek can just mean messenger. Mm. So it's possible in certain cases, it's, it's a theophany, it's, it's a real divine appearance, but it doesn't have, I have no problem with it being an angel, uh, because when I get to the end of Revelation 22, when John goes to worship the angel, no, 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 don't worship me, only worship God, okay? Mm -hmm. And yet we see worship offered to Jesus in this very same way. So uh, you can bow down and worship him in a way that you can't worship an angel. So which, are the, which of the theophanies are the Son of God speaking, where Hebrew says that he did not speak in the Son? Please listen to this one. God did not, not, not speak in the Son in the Old Testament period. He spoke in various ways. In these last days, in New Testament times, he speaks in the Son. That would surely suggest he was not speaking in his Son. I'll tell you why, because the Son didn't come into existence until Matthew and Luke. I think that's Matthew. a very exaggerated reading of Hebrews chapter Quite 1, so. which is simply telling us that the <coughs> revelation uh, that has come in the Son is superior to that which came before. The idea that that means the Son did not exist, I don't think would have even crossed the minds of anybody who read well, it's, Hebrews it's chapter 1. It's refuted as, as it goes. Hebrews well, 1 of course. explicitly refutes it as it goes on. Since it says he, he created all things by him. Yes, and not and for him, but by him. It says he spoke through the prophets. Yeah. Well, he spoke through angels, too. Okay, yes. but he doesn't say that he spoke through the prophets at many yes. times in various ways. But now the yes. primary way he's speaking is not through the prophets, but through the son. That's all it's saying. And then he yes. explicitly identifies the son as pre-existent yes. from the beginning. God, gentlemen, I'm getting the, I'm getting the wine down from uh, from <laughs> my floor uh, manager. We're, that that uh, is the uh, conclusion of part two. I want to thank you all for a very spirited debate, and I think uh, we should give another hand. <laughs>
uh, you have the imperfect form of I me mean that is used when it's speaking of the Logos, which does not refer to a point of origin in time or a point of creation. But as far back as you want to push the beginning, the Logos is already in existence. And that's the, what you have in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word has eternally existed. The Word was proston theon, face to face with God. And the Word was as to his nature, theos, God. Uh, all things were made through him. Now, the, the term autu that is used there can be a masculine or a neuter. But all modern translations that I know of uh, say him because it is the one who becomes flesh in John 1.14. It is, an, I think, an eisegetical insertion to say, well, no, this is just sort of a plan or it's some type of a concept that's eternally existed with God because this same one is described in John 1.18 as the monogenes theos, the unique God. This is the one who has exegeted the Father. You have to see that 118 and 11 are bookends. And so if you don't allow 118 to inform who the Logos is here, you have a plan up here, but now you have the monogenes theos here. Uh, that, that creates an imbalance and I think a contradiction in the text. Okay, Dr. Buzzard, 90 seconds if you could respond. Yeah, I just differ, obviously. I think Logos is not a person until it becomes a person in the 14th verse. And I will make this grammatical point that will be of interest to you, that if you look at the light, which is a neuter word in Greek, you will find it's neuter, natural enough, afto, the light. When you get to verse 10, remarkably, it's become afton, a person, because Jesus has now come on the scene after John the Baptist shows up. That's where the logos, it, the wisdom and plan of God, has gone from a neuter, a thing, to afton, the light is now a person walking. And that's where, as James White says so well, that's where the monoyenese son comes in. Jesus is what wisdom and word became. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, question, tell us who you are and who your question's uh, focused on. Yes, um, I'm Sam from Chicago. My question is directed to the Unitarians, particularly Joe, I think is his name. That is named Joe, not Sir Anthony Buzzard, but Buzzard, the other gentleman. It has to do with the concept of shaliach. He kept saying that Jesus could receive the worship that belongs only to God because he's God's agent. Well, my question is this. The apostles were also the agents of God and Christ, respectively. And in the book of Revelation, if you read chapter 22, verse 6 and 16, Revelation chapter 22, verse 6 and 16, it says that the angel who spoke to John, was the agent of God and Christ, respectively. With that said, could the apostles go around saying, I am Jesus Christ, or God the Father, therefore worship me, because they were the agents of God and Christ? And if so, then why did the angel refuse to receive worship, seeing that he was the shiliach, the agent of God and Christ, respectively? So that's my question directed to the Unitarians. Okay, okay. Uh, I'd like to read uh, two definitions of, uh, according to Jewish law, what a shliach is, uh, which is an, uh, the word means an agent, and it's called the law of agency. First is from the Jewish Encyclopedia. The law of agency deals with the status of a person known as the agent acting by direction of another, the principal, and thereby legally binding the principal in this connection with the third person. The person who binds a principal in this manner is his agent, known in his Jewish law as a shiluach or shliach. When the descent, the, re, the relation of the former to the latter is known as agency. Um, now, <clears throat> the bottom line on this, this is from uh, the Babylonian Talmud, Kiddushim 41b, but it's actually quoted in the Mishnah, which is much earlier, is a man's agent is like himself. Wait, got another paper. This, uh, uh, this is from the Encyclopedia of the Jewish Religion. The main point of the Jewish law of agency is expressed, expressed in the dictum, a person's agent is regarded as the person himself. Now, as you drop on down uh, in this, you're told that the person sending the agent will specify what he's allowed to do, what his power is. In the case of, uh, in the case of Yeshua, all power was given to him from above. He was acting as God on earth but I don't believe that he was God on earth. The agents, the apostles, when they were sent out, they were limited in what they could do, uh, just like Moses in the first coming. He was the sent one. He was the shliach. 
but he was limited. He couldn't call down. He couldn't call down uh, plagues at will. It came as it was directed by the Father. So okay. that would be the difference between the two. Thank you. And a rebuttal, 90 seconds. Yeah, uh, all of the issues that were raised haven't been addressed to this moment. For, for example, John 12 saying that the glorious Lord that Isaiah saw was Jesus in Isaiah, the sixth chapter. So all of these arguments about Shaliach and the sent one are completely irrelevant. The, the sent one was not from the beginning. If he was from the beginning, which is explicit in John 1 and explicit in Hebrews the ten, uh, chapter 1 and explicit in 1 John 1, 1 and other texts, the, the agent was not an uncreated eternal being and the one that created the whole universe. And when he came into the world, even the demons said, you are the Holy One of God. They recognized no who he was. They didn't just say, you know, you've been sent by the big man and we're scared of the big man. They said, no, we know who you are and we are in big trouble. So I let's agree. just go with the explicit text that say who he is and not be dissuaded or pushed to the side. Also, it's very interesting that early rabbinic literature makes reference to the followers of Jesus worshiping two powers. Where did they get that idea from? It's because they understood the worship of him as divine, but they didn't understand God's triunity because they rejected the revelation of the Messiah. Thank you. Uh, next question from our studio audience, your name, who your question is directed to, and your question. My name is Sandy Zimmerman from Phoenix, Arizona. My question is, if Yeshua is not God, why is God allowing him to be worshipped in Revelation, breaking the first commandment? Directed to? The non-Trinitarian group. Okay. Yeah. He is worshipped as the Messiah. There's a Greek word, latrevo, which is used of religious worship. It's not used of Jesus in the New Testament. That's my point. Very important distinction. Secondly, in the book of Hebrews, the first chapter, he labors to show that Jesus is superior to angels. You remember it? Superior to angels. Think about that. If you think Jesus is God, why would you bother arguing that he's better than the angels? It's silly. The idea had not entered the writer's head to think that he is God. That would make two gods. No, he has to argue with text after text after text that Jesus is superior to an angel. Think about that. Why not just say he's God, for goodness sake? Get on with it. It's a very simple issue at stake here. Rebuttal. Hebrews chapter 1 actually says exactly that. Uh, we were just told it was silly to demonstrate that Jesus is superior to the greatest created things, and yet the writer of the Hebrews does exactly that in Hebrews chapter 1, identifying Jesus as Yahweh and saying he created all things. But then we just said, well, Latruo is not used of Jesus. Listen to these words in Revelation chapter 5. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them. That's every creature. If Jesus is a creature, he'd be worshiping himself, saying... To him who sits on the throne and the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and mm. the elders fell down and worshipped. Now the term worship there is proskuneo. Mm. The idea being that's somehow less than Latruo. Except this is the worship being given by all of creation and all the living creatures to him who sits upon the throne, which we all agree around this table, is truly God. But it's given to him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. That would be absolute idolatry if the Lamb is a created being. The text says every created being enters into this worship. Is the Lamb a created being? Then he's worshiping himself. The text is very plain. And I also would point out that although Anthony has told us that why doesn't the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 1 just go ahead and say he's God? He does. And Anthony Hebrews said one, that's six. one of the explicit one, places in the New Testament where he does so. I don't believe in two gods, only oh, one. Right. We're giving you the simple answer for what the Bible's saying. Okay. Uh, next question from our studio audience. Your name and who your question is directed to. I'm Mike, and I'm from Oceanside, California. I'd like to address this question first to Dr. Brown and then have Dr. Buzzard respond to it if he would. And the question is, if Jesus is not every bit as much God as Yahweh, then he cannot be the perfect sacrifice for sin as Trinitarians claim he is. What then do non-Trinitarians place their trust in for the sacrifice for their sins, and can a non-Trinitarian truly be saved in the Trinitarian's point of view? Mm. Let, let me first address the last part of that, 
uh, can a non-Trinitarian be saved? That's, that's for God to decide. I have grave concern for the gentleman across from me, as, as I've told them plainly, because of their denial of the scriptural testimony of who Jesus is, because of what I see as idolatrous things being said about a man as opposed to God tabernacling among us. So I have grave concerns. Ultimately, God is the judge. But if we deny the explicit testimony of the word in many, many, many different places, can we be saved? I have grave concerns over that when it pertains to the person of Jesus. As, as to could a mere man save us, an immortalized man, a glorified man, a man appointed as, as the Son of God, no, absolutely not, because God alone is the Savior and God alone is the Redeemer. And a human being alone does not have the power to pay for the sins of the entire human race. Even a perfect human being who is, in fact, the second Adam, he comes from heaven. As the scripture says over and over and over again, it is the divine son who comes down from heaven, takes his residence among us, and dies for the sins of the world. If not for that, we do not have hope. Right to add? Uh, no, I, I just wanted to, to emphasize uh, my concern, likewise, with Dr. Brown is based upon not some type of unfriendliness toward the gentleman across from me who seemed to be wonderfully kind gentlemen, but my conviction is that as the Apostle John himself said, if you do not confess the Son, you do not have the Father either. And I do not believe that a Son who merely came into existence at the time of Bethlehem is what's described. And if I really believe this is true, then the greatest act of love that I can extend toward either of these gentlemen is to try my best to communicate these things to you. It is not out of hatred. It is, it is not out of some political thing from the past. If I, certainly you must agree. If I believe what I'm oh, saying, of course. then of I course. must express oh, my course, concern about your eternal so, so must we. Yes. I've been told that I don't believe in God because I believe there's a devil. I've been told that I don't speak in tongues enough that I couldn't be saved. I've heard this from every single denomination. This is nothing new. I simply don't think that it's wrong for God to appoint a sinless, virginly born person who has no human father. If God chooses to appoint him as the lamb to die for my sins, I'll accept it. I don't see the evidence for a second Yahweh. I keep hearing about Yahweh and Yahweh. This is very frightening to me. There's a Yahweh in heaven who doesn't come to the earth. Then there's a Yahweh in the womb of Mary. That sounds awfully like two Yahwehs to me. That gives me great concern. Joseph, you want to add anything to that? The, uh, you know, as they express their concern, uh, to, um, to see Yeshua as God, to me, uh, it is, you know, by reverse, it, it's idolatry. And uh, I don't believe that the Jewish believers of the first century, uh, I don't believe that Paul, I don't believe that the passages that are used uh, uh, that are interpreted in the way they are today, um, that that's how they were understood in that time. Can, can I just, can I add something? Uh, I think I'd give a clarification, at least from where I'm coming. Uh, you ever see the, mu the movie um, Back to the Future? And the young man goes into the 30 years back in time from the 1980s to the 1950s, and he goes into the, to the, uh, uh, to the drugstore, and the man asks him, uh, what will you have? And he says, well, give me a tab. And he says, you don't get a tab till you check out. So he says, give me a Pepsi free. And so he says, well, the only kind of Pepsi you get is one you pay for. So he says, well, give me something sugar free. So he gives him black coffee. Now, he said everything right. But somewhere in there, the, the, over 30 years, the meanings for these words had changed. And I believe that, that people are looking at uh, the, the passages here and interpret them in a different light than the way they were understood originally. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time for uh, one more question from our studio audience. Tell us your name, uh, your question, and who it's directed to. My name is Sally Miller, and I, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. My question is, um, uh, in the Shema, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. And the Hebrew word for one is echad. Now, I know they mentioned this already, but um, it's my understanding that echad encompasses multiple dimensions in this unity. And uh, the uh, scripture where uh, the husband and wife, Adam and his wife are one, is also echad. And they certainly are 
different dimensions. So um, how, uh, how do you uh, respond, the non-Trinitarian side respond to this, uh, this comment? Dr. Buzzard? Yeah, uh, there are 970 occurrences of the word echad. It means one. I would uh, invite you to ask any Jewish child this high to put up one finger. It means one. It's just exactly like the English word one. Exactly. One single. Go to any lexicon, check it out. One single Lord. That's clear to me. There is a prodigious piece of nonsense, if I may put it that way, impolitely, out there in internet land to suggest that Echad is really compound one. Go to the dollar store, pay your dollar, and they go, go to the counter and they'll say it's compound one, $13. It's false. It's a language trick of major proportions. Echad means one single. Abraham was only one person. Guess what the Hebrew word is there? Echad. Everything is plural. If you want to take cells in Abraham or arms and legs, everything's plural. But you're being played a grand trick when you're being told that echad means more than one. It's a numeral adjective, meaning one single item. 970 times, I invite you to go through every one of them. As our friends have done, we've done it endlessly. Echad means one single, just like one. Joseph, you've got your Hebrew open there, so you, I think you want to add something to that. In the book of Joshua, it's talking about the, the kings that were conquered. Uh, by Joshua when the people came into the land. And it has a list of, of them, 31 of them. It starts off the king of Jericho. It says one, but the Hebrew word is echad. It's not yachid. It's echad used there for a singular one. It can be used for a singular one. It can be used for a, like a husband and a wife. But it's not restricted to that. So you can't make a case from the Shema on that. Not two fleshes, one flesh, not two fleshes. Okay, rebuttal, 90 seconds. Yeah, you know, I, I got to be honest here. That, that's a miserably disappointing answer from, from sincere guys. I, I, I got to be honest. First, check the counts, you know, all the references to numbers. Like you mentioned, Sir Anthony, 7,000 references to Yahweh. Yep. You know, that, that's an incorrect number by, by hundreds. Uh, either way, j just check the references rather than requote them, okay? But the bottom line is, Echad just means one. We believe in one God. What's a good number to use? Uh, how about one? So echad means one. It can refer to one couple. It can refer to one team. It can refer to one pen. It can, it can refer Amazing. to one debate. Here, uh, uh, Exodus chapter 35, verse 13, they made 50 gold clasps, used them to fashion the two sets of curtains together so that the tabernacle was a unit. What's the word used? Echad. So uh, uh, Genesis 1, that Lila and, and, uh, and Yom, the, uh, night and day, is one day. So the word echad simply talks about one God, and he's the only God that we worship. That's the primary revelation in the Old Testament. So when you look in the talk, the Hebrew Scriptures, the argument is not, what's the nature of God? Is he three in one or two in one or one? No, no, it's only worship this one God because there's only one Yahweh. There's not a Yahweh in this town, this town, this town. One God, we worship him exclusively. And echad simply uses the word one just like in English. Very, very simply, proving monotheism does not prove Unitarianism. We are monotheists. The question is, is that one being of God shared by three divine persons, as the scriptures teaches, or do we have to close one eye and say, well, we're defending monotheism. I am a monotheist. I have defended monotheism over and over and over again against many, many different perspectives. But it's, proving monotheism is not proving Unitarianism. Gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for your excellent responses. We're going to conclude now with a closing statement from each of our experts, again limited to two minutes, at which time I'm going to conclude with prayer. Gentlemen, let's begin with your um, two-minute closing statements, and we're going to begin with the Trinitarians. Uh, I, I think what's clear is that we haven't had a need to quote many, many other scholars perpetually, although we easily could. We've quoted scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. The fascinating thing is the earliest witnesses to these scriptures, the disciples of the first apostles, writing at the end of the first century and beginning of the second century, made explicit reference to the deity of Jesus, even more explicit language than the New Testament used. Where did they learn that from? Did they learn it from something that came hundreds and hundreds of years later, or did they learn it from the apostles themselves? So here's what we've looked at. 
We've looked at divine appearances like Genesis 18 and Isaiah 6 and other passages that have not yet been refuted, not even a drop, speaking of God appearing bodily in the Hebrew Scriptures and explicitly identified at times as Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus said of himself that he came down from heaven. It says he came from God, was going to God. It says in Philippians 2 that he existed previously in the form of God. He says of himself, not I represent the Alpha and the Omega, but I myself, the very same thing said about Almighty God elsewhere in the book of Revelation, two other passages, Jesus says about himself and takes even further in Revelation chapter 22, I am, he says, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, it is impossible for a created being to say those words. That's why Hebrews 1 clearly calls him God. That's why Thomas said, my Lord and my God. That's why the scriptures says explicitly, passage after passage in the New Testament, that through him the universe was made. That's why every created thing in heaven and earth will bow down and worship him the exact same way they worship God. That only goes to an eternal divine being I'm only concerned with being faithful to the scriptures. I worship one God, one God only, as he has revealed himself to us. That's plain. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Dr. White. Not much I can add to that, so let me simply read to you the words of Melito of Sardis written at the end of the second century, one of the earliest writers that we have again in that early time period. And so he was lifted up upon a tree, and an 